bringing one special business meeting to order. We'll begin tonight by acknowledging that buildings within Minneapolis Public Schools are located within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. Minnesota comes from the Dakota name for this region, Minnesota Makoche, translating to the land where the waters reflect the skies or cloudy waters. MPS recognizes the original peoples of this place and are committed to make ongoing efforts to educate the community about the relationship that Dakota people have to this area, both historically and today as they remain here in their home. Thank you. Due to the current local state and federal emergency declarations and guidance regarding the COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting of the Minneapolis Board of Education is being conducted in accordance with Minnesota statute 13D.021 with some members participating remotely via electronic means. This meeting is being live streamed on our website and on channel 15 and a recording will be available in both places. Before we begin, I'll note some legal and process expectations for both the board and the public listening. First, as required by law, we will take every vote by roll call. I will ask the clerk to call the roll by district order followed by at-large members. Second, board members, please mute yourselves when not talking to avoid background noise. Third, during discussions, directors participating remotely, please use the raise your hand feature. I'll ask Vice Chair Arneson to process questions and comments from those in person. And lastly, for the benefit of all of us, but in particular for our interpreters and those using closed captions, please remember to speak clearly, slowly, and into your microphone. Directors in person, remember to turn on your microphone before speaking. Directors participating remotely, please remember to unmute. Thank you. Director Polly, will you please call the roll? Director Arneson. Here. Director Alamine. Here. Director Ali. Here, here. Director Surreal. Here. Director Inns. Here. Director Jordan. Director Jordan. Director Caprini. Here. Hi, I'm here. Director Polly's here. Chair Ellison. Here. Student Rep Geber Meskel. Thank you, we have a quorum. Next, we will approve our agenda for this special business meeting, which includes three items, a declaration of Tyler Johnson Day, a COVID-19 response update, and a resolution regarding support for an in-person learning option for our secondary students. Director Arneson, will you please move approval of the agenda? So moved. May I have a second with last name for the record? Second, Caprini. Thank you. Our agenda has been moved and seconded. If there's any discussion, please raise your hand to be recognized. Seeing no hands, will the clerk please call the roll on the agenda? Director Arneson. Yes. Director Alamine. Yes. Director Ali. Yes. Director Surreal. Yes. Director Inns. Yes. Director Jordan. Yes. Director Caprini. Aye. Director Polizzi, yes, Chair Allison. Yes, thank you. That motion carries and we have an approved agenda. For our first item, I'm gonna turn it over to Director Caprini to move this resolution to get it in front of us and introduce the guests joining us. Director Caprini, would you please read and move the resolution? Thank you, Chair Ellison. This is a resolution declaring February 26, 2020 as Tyler Johnson Day within the Minneapolis Public Schools. Whereas on February 7, 2021, Minneapolis Public Schools alumnus Tyler Johnson became a Super Bowl champion with his team, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And whereas Mr. Johnson was a successful student athlete during his time at MPS, including at City View, Northeast Middle and North High School. And whereas Mr. Johnson has used his platform at both the University of Minnesota, as well as in the NFL to promote youth sports, North Minneapolis and community service. 
and whereas the school board, district, and school leaders, teachers, classmates, teammates, are proud of what Tyler has accomplished and watch with excitement for what he will do next. Now there be it resolved that the board of directors of special school district number one hereby declares February 26, 2021 as Tyler Johnson Day within the Minneapolis Public Schools. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Elamine. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Caprini, please go ahead. Thank you. And thank you, Chair Ellison, for supporting this inclusion of this item on tonight's agenda. I know we have a lot going on in a very ch challenging year, but for me, that makes it that much more important to take the time to recognize the good and the fun things. As most of you know, I'm pretty passionate about the positive power of youth athletics and activities. So it is my honor to recognize the shining example of an MPS alum achieving the pinnacle of their sport. Even as an NFL player and now a Super Bowl champion, Tyler Johnson is still and will always be a proud MPS North Polar grad and Northside kid. Speaking for many, as this resolution said, Tyler, we are so proud of you and we can't wait to see what you do next. At this time, it's my honor to introduce the, uh, Tyler's former principal, Dr. Sean Harris Berry, and the current principal at North, Principal Mari Frieslaven. Dr. Sean Harris Berry is now currently the Associate Super Superintendent of High Schools. Dr. Berry, would you like to say a few words? Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Director Caprini, for the opportunity to celebrate Tyler Johnson, a 2016 graduate of North High School. First, let me say congratulations, Tyler. I cannot think of anyone more worthy of such an honor. You are definitely the pride of the North High. Let me make it very clear tonight. North High did not make Tyler Johnson. Tyler Johnson entered North High the fall of 2012 as a returning polar. You see, he attended the daycare at North High in the late 90s. When he returned as a freshman, he was already on the path of greatness. His parents and grandparents had instilled in him a spirit of humility coupled with perseverance. The founding staff of North High School of Arts and Communications Responsibility was to join in partnership with his parents to further cultivate what they had already activated in his life. In doing so, at the end of his senior year, Tyler not only was prepared for the U of M, the NFL, but also a plan B if it became necessary. While at North, he enrolled in advanced placement and college courses. Tyler is an example of the manifestation of unlimited potential despite a student's zip code. When provided with love, social, emotional, and academic support. Tyler, I am proud of you. Keep God first, young man, and he will be faithful to continue to make room for your gifts. To everyone, I say, happy Tyler Johnson Day. I return it back to Director Caprini. Thank you, Dr. Harris Berry. Next, I'd like to um, have the current principal of North, Principal Mari Frieslaven, say a few words. Director Caprini, I told you I can't follow Dr. Berry. <laughs> Jeez. Dr. Berry said it so, so, so very well. Um, she had the, the honor of, of being Tyler's graduating principal. I have the honor of working with the whole family. Um, we still have Tyler's little sister, Titiana here. Um, and I cannot echo Dr. Berry's sentiments enough. Really the whole family, all of our interactions with Tyler as he's continued to support North High, as he's continued to support his community, his parents, their undying love for their children and their school, sitting next to you know um, them at, at games and, and, and seeing their love for their, their child, seeing Tyler's humility, seeing the whole family's humility, it's been a joy to come in 
and sit in this space and be in that space and bask in that glow. So thank you for including me tonight. Thank you for letting me ride on Tyler's coattails a little bit. Um, I'm a Tampa Bay fan for life now. And uh, thank you for doing this and making Friday Tyler Johnson Day. I can't wait to bust out um, all of my Tyler Johnson gear on Friday. Thank you, Principal Frieslaven. And finally, it is my great honor to introduce Tyler's parents, Ms. Lucretia Johnson and Mr. Tyrone Johnson to say a few words on his behalf. Tyrone, Lucretia, please go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. We are so honored and we are so grateful for you all to um, be acknowledging Tyler and his great success. Um, we first of all, just wanna say we have encountered and just love uh, the Minneapolis Public Schools. We've encountered so many great teachers, um, principals, uh, just great role models um, for not only Tyler, but our other children. And we're so grateful and um, honored that he's getting this. Um, this day. This yeah. day, yes. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us and being a part of this. I'm looking forward to seeing and hearing the fun ways schools will mark the, the day on Friday. Chair Ellison, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you again, Director Caprini, for bringing this idea forward. And thank you to Dr. Harris Berry, Principal Friedslaven, and to Tyler's parents for joining us. Directors, it's been moved and seconded to declare Friday as Tyler Johnson Day. Is there any further discussion? Uh, Chair Ellison, we have one comment from the boardroom. Thank you. Please go ahead. Director Alameen. I just wanted to again recognize the Tyler Johnson family. Um, having the opportunity for my son to play alongside with him, to be able to attend the games with you, um, to be able to be at North High with you, it was just an honor. And to continue to see him excel, it's truly an honor to know him, to have sat beside him, to have uh, eaten dinner with him and just sitting with you guys. So definitely know that we love you, we support you, and you continue to have our support here from the north side of Minneapolis. Thank you. Thank you so much. We love you too. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no more hands, will Clerk Polly please call the roll on this resolution? Director Arneson. Aye. Director Alameen. Yes. Director Ali. Yes. Director Cerillo. Yes. Director Inns. Yes. Director Jordan. Yes. Director Caprini. Aye. Director Polly is yes. Chair Ellison. Yes, thank you. That motion carries. And February 26, 2021 shall be Tyler Johnson Day in Minneapolis Public Schools. Anyone like to make any final comments? Yes, Thank you. I, I would actually. Wait, just okay. have something from the boardroom, Chair Ellison, Director Caprini. Thank you, thank you so Please much. I, I just wanted to say thank you to Ryan Strack, our um, government board administrator who worked with me on this uh, project. And I just cannot tell you enough how patient and how incredibly um, exciting, exciting it was for me to be able to learn from him as to how to go about writing a resolution. So Ryan, I'd like to say thank you. Director Cerillo. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I wanna thank uh, Director Caprini for bringing forward this resolution in the midst of uh, so many challenges that we are going through. This is really refreshing, inspiring, and incredible. Thank you. Thank you. And I wanna thank again, Tyler Johnson's parents for being here. Dr. Harris Ferry and Principal Frieslaven, um, those beautiful words. For our next item, I'm gonna turn it over to superintendents and team to provide an update on COVID-19 response and on planning for a return for secondary students. Superintendent, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Ellison. Good evening, board directors, uh, student representative Deborah Meskel, 
staff and members of the public joining us this evening. Um, I too would just like to echo my appreciation for being able to recognize past, uh, current, and, and future students um, at Minneapolis, Minneapolis Public Schools. So thank you for that opportunity this evening with uh, acknowledging and recognizing Tyler Johnson and officially making Friday Tyler Johnson Day. This evening we wanna spend uh, some time discussing how we plan to respond to the governor's February 17th uh, guidance to have all of our secondary students in grades six through 12 return to in-person learning by March 8th. And once again, you know, the timing of this announcement wasn't necessarily expected um, and just uh, very similar to our elementary guidance that was announced. This declaration has added a bit of uh, significant concern, worries, um, debate about students participating in in-person learning. And for, for us, we've tried to remain focused on continued planning to ensure that we can make our secondary transition in to in-person learning go as smoothly as possible. Uh, some of the things we've done, we've met with the uh, Minnesota Department of Education, Minnesota Department of Health leaders. Additionally, I've sat in meetings with our regional support team, which includes state and city of Minneapolis health officials, so that we can better understand our health rates um, and the public health implications of any decisions we make. Also, I've had the opportunity to meet with colleagues in the Council of Great City Schools, as well as superintendent colleagues locally and nationally who have had experience with hybrid and full in-person learning this school year, uh, which has been helpful to understand what worked and what didn't work from their vantage points. Ultimately, we know that while it's good to learn from the experiences of others, we have to do what we think is best for our families and our staff here in Minneapolis. With that in mind, our recommendation is to create a two-step return process for students in grades six through 12, as well as our special education students. Uh, the first step would begin next week when schools would bring back cohorts of students to participate in in-person academic supports during the school day. And the second and more systemic plan, of course, barring any health and safety factors that would prevent it, would bring our secondary staff back on March 29th and then stage nine through 12th grade students returning the week of April 12th and our sixth through eighth grade students one week later, the week of April 19th. A separate timeline for our special education level three and level four students in grades six through 12, along with our transition plus will be shared in this presentation as well. <coughs> the team will um, certainly provide uh, some more details momentarily, but I wanted to share some context and an overview of our planning. So what you will hear this evening are many of the same considerations and, and caveats we discussed when we decided to move forward with planning a return to in-person learning for our elementary students. We're not recommending a return to in-person learning lightly um, and nothing set in stone. So if we see an unexpected uh, change, uh, regression in our improving COVID-19 rates, we will certainly reassess and bring forward that information to the board and public. All along, I've stated that we're trying, and I am trying, uh, to balance two equally important values throughout this pandemic, the health and safety of staff and students, and the need to provide students with an educational experience that will lay the foundation, academic foundation for their future successes. Uh, of course, you're all aware we've worked tirelessly to err on the side of health and safety, and I absolutely think that's the right uh, thing to have done. But with our rates declining in Minneapolis and in Hennepin County, which you'll hear um, some of those statistics this evening, we believe this is an appropriate time to start reintroducing our secondary students back into the physical school buildings and classrooms. So at this time, I'm gonna transition through um, an overview of our planning, and then I will have staff briefly provide some additional details. Of course, we'll then continue planning and, and bring you another update at the board meeting in March. So to begin with, um, I referenced the guidance that came out from the Minnesota Department of Education on February 17th. Um, the first point, all districts must offer some type of in-person learning by March 8th. 
Uh, we also will continue with having distance learning as an option uh, pursuant to the governor's executive order. One of the significant changes, uh, there is no longer a requirement for rolling starts. As you're all aware in our elementary schools, we begin um, our third through fifth grade students this Monday as part of a rolling start continuation for our elementary. We are no longer required to do that for our secondary students. We also um, are given the guidance to look and monitor, look toward and monitor our COVID spread within a school and uh, more significantly the staffing capacity for making decisions around our county level data. And of course, uh, there has been a, an increased recommendation for COVID testing for students and staff. And we continue to offer that testing um, both at the Davis Center in partnership with the community providers, as well as we will have that at our schools every two weeks for staff. Secondary social distancing is required to be at least three feet. And so wanting all of our parents to understand that that is the minimum uh, social distancing that we will be required to adhere to. And another significant um, guidance that has been issued is seating charts are required at our secondary lunchtime with the recommendation for students to be eating in the same, uh, with the same students every day. And then finally, uh, there is no longer a requirement to meet with our regional support team, um, but we've been so fortunate in our partnership that we will continue that and have continued that. So looking at our secondary approach, um, phase three, which you may be familiar with from our previous discussion in the fall, which is really targeted supports for students. And we're looking at this happening from for grades uh, sixth grade through our transition plus beginning March 1st. And this is really uh, school based and school driven. So our schools will be prioritizing uh, a number of different possible students to receive these types of support. And you can see the list there from students receiving special education, English language, uh, English learning students, as well as homeless, highly mobile, um, in addition to those who might need some academic or support for graduation. Schools are building designs. Um, each school is building and designing invitations for these students um, based on their building data, and they can begin operating this um, on March 1st, which is really uh, contingent upon the students and parents wanting this offer, um, or, or I guess um, taking advantage of this opportunity as well as having the staff available to participate. Um, this is a voluntary uh, effort from our staff. And so it, really, real, it will really be dependent upon the number of staff we have available at the schools to support this uh, phase three. Transportation um, may also be provided for some of our students gr student groups. And then just to be clear that this will be happening while students are participating in distance learning. So those supplemental supports will occur um, in, in operation with distance learning. And of course, we will still have uh, meals provided and our health and safety protocols will be followed and enforced. And then moving toward phase five, which is uh, in person, um, we're looking at for our middle schools, uh, grades six through eight, they would begin on April 19th, as I mentioned earlier. We would have them starting one week after our 9th through 12th grade students. And the rationale for this is to promote a smooth transition, um, as well as looking at our capacity related to our transportation and our staffing. Um, certainly, we recognize the, 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 the significant need and urgency for our high school students um, who are looking for credit retainment on, and making sure that they're on track for graduation. So we first wanted to make sure we had their um, transition in place. Phase five in-person learning will be based on family preferences uh, throughout registration. So once again, similar to what we did with our elementary students, we are uh, will be sending out an application for families and they will be able to let us know if they would like to remain in distance learning or have their student uh, participate in in-person learning. We're also um, showing that we're recommending in-person versus hybrid um, based on conversations and experiences in other districts. There's more in-school support for students. Um, there's a better opportunity to establish routines and rituals. And of course, um, 
we'll have some change in our numbers in our schools because of the um, families choosing to remain in distance learning. And it's certainly more um, viable uh, operationally for staff when we offer in-person versus a hybrid model. And then finally, we're working on providing adequate bus transportation. Um, we do have at this time um, access testing, which is occurring, and we received recent notification around the MCAs and the requirement of those exams um, needing to take place. So we have to support those transportation requests along with um, the re-entry to in-person learning. And as a way to uh, accommodate some of that, we'll be offering mileage reimbursement to transportation eligible families who choose to transport students themselves. In looking at our high schools, uh, grades nine through 12, we again will offer a phase five in-person learning based on the family preference through our registration, which will be going out tomorrow to families. Um, again, distance learning will remain as an option and available to those families who prefer to make that choice. Similarly uh, to middle school, we're recommending in-person versus hybrid um, because we can offer more in-school support for students. So once again, the routines and rituals, um, the student numbers uh, we're, will be less than what a full, full school population will be because some of our students and their families will continue to remain in distance learning, which makes it more operationally viable for us. We're also working now to address some of the complex scheduling against staffing availability um, so we can ensure that our students will receive the required graduation credits. And then just as a note, because I know this is uh, on the uh, forefront of minds of not only our, our students, but as our staff members as well and parents, um, having beginning conversations around what graduations could look like, proms or the ACT uh, testing um, considerations. And so at this time, we do not have guidance from uh, the state on graduation and proms, but we are um, certainly um, beginning those discussions and look forward to getting updates and sharing them with the board and public as we receive them. Next, looking at our secondary special education services and returning to in-person learning. So we would start, um, I'll start by asking Associate Superintendent Cox to give a little more detail um, on this slide as there's always some nuances to special education and the groups that we're going to be um, identifying for return to in-person learning. Thank well. you so much, Superintendent. Um, we will be um, onboarding our students who receive special education services and have more intense needs um, a little earlier than the rest of the secondary students. So group one are students that will start have a start date of March 22nd. Those students will include um, those in federal setting three programs, grades nine through 12, our Transition Plus Team 1 students, our Harris and Green Team students, and our River Bend High School students. Those staff will be returning to the building on March 15th. They will have a planning week of March 15th through the 19th, and those students will be in person five days a week. Our Group 2 students will have a start date of April 12th. That will include our students in Federal Setting 3 citywide programs, grades six through eight, the remaining students for Transition Plus and Harrison and our grades six through eight at both River Bend and Metro programs at Wilder. Those staff will have a return to building on March 29th and will have a transition planning week on March 29th through April 1st. They also will have an in-person schedule five days a week. And if you are a parent who's out there wondering which one your student might be if they would perhaps be at Harrison or T plus, please don't worry. Our principals and case managers will be reaching out to you to discuss the return date for your student. Back to you, Superintendent. Thank you, Associate Superintendent Cox. Um, before I turn it over to uh, Associate Superintendent Cox again to discuss the health and safety guidance, I just want to highlight some of the um, uh, challenges that we're identifying in our secondary um, return to in-person learning. This is not an exhaustive list, 
but it is one that um, we do need to bring to the attention of the board and uh, as part of the consideration for why we have the timeline that we do and our, our planning uh, moving forward. So the first is uh, around our transportation capacity. I think many are aware that we are um, operating in-person learning for our elementary students right now and maintaining the required social distancing on those bus routes has required us to um, operate more buses in our elementary um, schools than we would typically. Um, the other significant piece is that our secondary students in high school um, do utilize met transit routes um, as well as school buses. And so just making sure that we have the coordination of the, the Metro Transit as well as uh, the remaining buses and capacity for, for students is part of this, this challenge. We also have our staffing capacity, capacity uh, to consider. And uh, in some cases, this is due to increased absences or quarantines. And as, as we know, with students back in school, one of the mitigation um, efforts, if there is a confirmed case, is to do contact mapping and then respond accordingly by quarantining those who have come into close contact with an individual who has a confirmed case. So we do have staffing uh, capacity considerations in that sense. And then as well, uh, staffing capacity related to space and our square footage in our schools. Uh, we do have to maintain the required three feet of social distancing. And if we get um, a significant number of our students who are wanting to come back into school um, uh, above what we have seen in our elementary schools, then we'll have to take a look at that um, in terms of our, our capacity. And then, of course, the one that has been um, significant and has been ongoing since uh, the pandemic um, is the impact of, of students, um, the, the trauma, and then just making sure we're supporting them in the re-entering to in-person learning. And you'll hear a little bit tonight about our supports that we'll be providing for, for students and staff as well as we receive our students um, back into in-person learning. And then finally, again, uh, community factors, the academic scheduling that we have with the complexity of licensure in our 9 through 12 grades, as well as uh, any kind of large uh, events, um, health and safety guidelines, which again, we'll hopefully get more information on from the Minnesota Department of Education. So with that, I will turn it over to Associate Superintendent Cox uh, to walk us through the health and safety guidance. Thank you, Superintendent. Well, let's start off with some data. So next slide, please. Our current case data um, looks like this. We have 14.1 cases per 10,000 in the city of Minneapolis as of February 16th. And remember that data from the city is about, legs about seven days behind. We also today got current um, case data from Hennepin County. So this is all of Hennepin County put together. They are currently at 18.1 cases per 10,000 as of February 15th. It's also good to note that the Hennepin County data puts the city of Minneapolis at 14.6 cases. So those are in relative alignment between the city of Minneapolis and Hennepin County. Just for some context, this puts us under 20 cases per 10,000 since February 4th. We always talk about demographics too, and we know that our Hispanic Latinx population is now under 30 cases per 10,000 and all other demographic areas are under 20 cases per 10,000. So again, social distancing and minimizing exposure will be a, a very important and critical mitigation strategy in our secondary programs. So social distancing again means keeping that space between yourselves and other. We will be able to create as much space as possible between people and a minimum of three feet is recommended for secondary students. We know that adults should continue to be six feet apart or use additional personal protective equipment. And our classrooms will be set for as much space as possible in the next few weeks as we prepare for the return of our secondary students. The way that we're creating and monitoring these social distance practices is again that arrangement of classroom furniture or reduction in class size or using alternative spaces in our schools for instruction. 
will mark off six feet of distance in areas where our staff or our students might congregate or have to wait. For example, places like the office or arrival and dismissal. We'll be keeping our students in small cohort groups for lunchtime with seating charts. And whenever possible, we'll be holding classes like physical education outside and encouraging our participants to spread out. Masks must be worn indoors during physical education classes. We'll be reminding our staff and our students about our procedures around face coverings and personal protective equipment. Face coverings or masks will be required at all times unless there is a medical, a developmental, or behavioral condition that makes it unreasonable to wear a mask. Our licensed school nurses will be helping our students in secondary and their families um, receive, get the documentation needed um, from doctors if this is a, a need for their student. We'll have clear face masks available where staffs are serving students in a setting where seeing a person's lips are necessary. We're strongly recommending that our adults are using face shields whenever possible during the school day, and they will be provided with those at their school. For our staff who are engaged in direct student support services, like feeding and other self-care activities, they will have access to additional PPE. Also, our COVID program coordinators at each school will monitor the inventory of PPE or per personal protective equipment and make sure that items are reordered prior, be to, prior to being needed um, via the request form. So let's talk a little bit about positive cases and how we are responding and how we will respond at the secondary level. For any adult positive cases, staff will contact myself and for students, our school licensed school nurses will lead efforts at their buildings. We'll have access to building access logs and staff directories with phone numbers will be used for contact tracing by both our own health services staff as well as the Minneapolis Health Department. Our Minnesota Department of Health and the Minneapolis Health Department will have decision making authority about positive cases high and low risk contacts, and make recommendations on any need to close buildings. We always remind our staff that confidentiality is key in these situations. Our health services department will help with communication to both staff and families moving forward. So let's just review that idea of close contacts versus low risk contacts. Remember, a close contact is anyone who spent a cumulative 15 minutes or more within six feet, regardless of their use of a face mask. There can be exceptions, and those would depend on the setting, the length of the contact, or the activity that people, our staff, or our students were engaged in. Our lower risk contacts, we know that in certain situations, individuals may have been with a confirmed positive COVID-19 case but not considered a close contact. They might have met that person in the hallway for a minute. Um, they might have passed them by in a lunch line. Those people and those staff and those students may be asked to more closely monitor symptoms, but will not have a need for quarantine. For isolation for a, a lab confirmed positive COVID-19 case, there's a minimum of 10 day isolation period. For people and for our staff and students who need to quarantine, there's a minimum of seven to 14 days in quarantine. And in Minneapolis Public Schools, we have taken a conservative approach and been using a 14 day quarantine rule. So we, um, have, we, we have worked with the Minnesota Department of Health and the Minneapolis Health Department, and there are no recommendations to close entire buildings at this time. Instead, we're considering where the case was in the building and how much time has passed since the person has been in the building. We know that surface transmissions pose a very low risk, so we anticipate that our school's buildings will not be closed um, very often. Now, the city of Minneapolis will continue to partner with us on recommendations moving forward. As we start to bring in those middle and high school students, it will become more challenging to contact map 
and we know that there might be larger number of students who will need to quarantine. We might also see more building closures too. State guidance also recommends a building closure if more than 5% of staff and students have symptoms. This is similar to what would happen during a typical influenza season. So when we think about reporting illnesses, it's important for us to educate and remind our staff, our students, and our families about the signs of illness and to please stay home if presenting any symptoms. symptoms. We want to make sure that staff are diligent about taking attendance daily, that they ensure that all staff and community providers that are in our school sign in every time they enter a building. We have created illness rooms at each school for any students who might become ill during the day. We also will have transportation available for ill students who need to go home or need medical care if their guardian cannot pick them up in a reasonable amount of time. So let's talk a little bit about what we've learned from, from positive cases so far. If there is a notification needed for a close contact that is a staff person, the principals will receive a communication from me regarding a staff who might need to isolate or quarantine. The principal will communicate to their staff member what their return date is from their isolation or their quarantine period. The principal makes a decision if that staff member can telework or will assist that staff member with leave paperwork if needed. For our students, our site health services team and our health services department will notify families whose students need to isolate or quarantine. The return date for students will also be shared with the principal. Principals will share information with families about the switch to distance learning for the quarantine period. We also know that's important that others in our school communities are notified. For our staff, I will send the principal a general notification letter for all staff. The principals will also hold a staff meeting as appropriate in their school. For all of our families, I will send a principal a general notification letter so they are aware that someone in the building tested positive for COVID-19. If you've been on our COVID dashboard lately, you know that we have created a link for, for our uh, staff members, for our families, and for our community regarding COVID cases at Minneapolis Public Schools. We have created a link for you um, for state reported data. So any school that has reported five or more confirmed cases in a building will be on this, um, on this link that you see in front of you um, for a two week period. Also, we will be starting tomorrow putting on our uh, COVID dashboard, the weekly positive cases updates from the week before. We will list out the names of the school, and we will also say the number of cases that were found and if all buildings were able to remain in operation. When our principals are actually having staff meetings with their staff, there, there are comprehensive talking points that are sent to the principal. Those include resources for our staff, reminders about confidentiality in any media request, the use of the Minnesota Department of Health decision tree and use of the Minneapolis Health Department and them providing us direction on both the um, isolation and quarantine periods. We wanna make sure that our principals are reinforcing and re encouraging the use of health and safety protocols that we have in our guidance. We wanna make sure that we remind people of those definitions of the low risk and the close contacts and then also provide them information on saliva testing. We also wanna make sure that we're providing support to our principals regarding academic considerations when there's a need for a classroom or someone in the school to quarantine or isolate. Our associate superintendents will assist their principals with immediate staffing needs. We know that there might be a movement to distance learning a whole class may move, an individual student may move, and there might be multiple students from different grade levels may move 
um, as it may be in a case for um, a positive uh, exposure on a bus. Students absent during the exposure may still be in person. So even though we might have a class moving to distance learning because of being quarantined, if a student was absent the day of exposure, they may, may still be in person and need in-person learning. Alternate plans if staff become ill or unable to teach may also need to be put in place. So as you can see, it can be complicated, so we want to make sure that our associate superintendents are providing any assistance needed to our principals at this time. So there's also activities that are going on behind the scenes, and those activities are um, as the case develops and as we begin our contact mapping, we're reviewing with the superintendent and associate superintendent so they're aware and can provide support to the principal. We're making notifications to the Minnesota Department of Health as well as getting that consultation from the Minneapolis Health Department. We provide a weekly board report, an update to all of our board members. We're notifying our risk management group, uh, staff person. We're providing extra cleaning as necessary, and we're also notifying our unions when there is a positive case. So that's it for my update tonight. I'm going to turn it over to Senior Officer Sullivan to talk a little bit about return to in-person work. Thank you so much. I'm just providing a brief update. Uh, just as we did with our elementary returning to person uh, to in-person work, we'll be doing the same uh, planning for our secondary staff as well. We will be bringing back secondary licensed and non-licensed staff, including our health services staff, to support in-person learning for our 6 through 12 students. As Associate Superintendent Cox mentioned, we're staggering this, so starting with our high school special education students, our students, uh, which are, our staff will be asked to return to work on March, March 15th with the transition week of the 15th to the 18th, and then an ask for all secondary to plan to return to work in person on March 29th with a transition week of March 29th through April 1st. So those letters to staff will go out this week. Um, and again, we'll also provide information in those letters around accommodations as we've, as we've done with our elementary staff. One thing I did want to did mention is around our reserve teachers. This is a, a, a very important part for us. We need to make sure we have adequate coverage for our teachers, especially with anticipated absences. In terms of distance learning, we'll continue our current model, um, but for in-person learning similar to elementary, we're continuing to hire um, cadres as building reserves, so really trying to limit um, any potential movement between buildings, but hiring specific reserves for schools. We're using our site-based uh, teachers on special assignment to help coverage. Uh, we're leveraging our student teachers as well with new guidance from Kelsey and the state. And finally, we, we have recalled uh, to on-call uh, status a number of our teachers, central office teachers and district program facilitators to support schools at any time. And, and to this point, we've had over 30 central office teachers supporting teaching in our classrooms, supporting our elementary students. So we'll continue that model as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Senior Officer Debet. Thank you. Thank you. So first of all, for the Lyme testing, I'm going to be talking about the methods of Lyme testing as required by the state. Excuse me, Senior Officer Devet, you're very muted right now. We don't hear you well. All right, is that better? That's a little better. Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks for letting me know. Um, so uh, saliva testing, uh, we're continuing our saliva testing being offered to all of our staff working in person in their school buildings and that will continue um, and expand as we move into secondary in-person learning. Free community testing also continues to be offered by the Minnesota Department of Health and partnering with the city of Minneapolis to continue to offer saliva testing uh, as possible at the Davis Center as well. So as we um, look towards implementing secondary, we'll be on the cadence that is um, set by the state where March 8th is our next testing date. And then once um, staff return, we follow that same cadence uh, of testing. So shortly we'll be launching um, a process to have our secondary schools identify saliva testing coordinators as we did with our elementary schools. They'll participate in that training and then help um, to assist with testing on those days of events. 
And just a reminder, uh, testing is encouraged for staff and students um, to happen on a regular basis while in person, but it is not required. And those test re results are confidential, provided only to the person who's been tested, and they are free and won't be billed to those insurance um, companies. And then a quick update on vaccinations. Uh, as you likely recall, the state of Minnesota and again, the Minnesota Department of Health are managing the vaccine rollout for all the education staff uh, in the state. Uh, we are helping through MPS to facilitate giving them contact information uh, as, as people are who are teaching in person or in person staff are prioritized for those vaccines. What we do know is between the two entities, we have offered about 4,100 4, vaccine opportunities. We do survey our staff because we do know that not all staff are able to take advantage of those vaccine opportunities if they want to when they're offered. Um, so we had about uh, a third of our staff responded to our last survey acknowledging that they did receive at least one vaccination opportunity from uh, through MPS communication. About half of those were actually able to secure an appointment. Um, and then the majority of our staff want to continue to receive information about vaccine opp opportunities. Again, the state continues to prioritize our educators and staff working in person um, and will be expanding to include our pre-K-12 staff with this rollout. What we do advise is that you pursue any and all vaccine opportunities that are offered to you, um, because as we've seen, sometimes there's some challenges in getting an appointment, even though you've received an invitation um, to schedule appointments. So it's important that staff continues to pursue any opportunity that they're provided, um, including signing up for the vaccine connector. Uh, just quickly uh, on building readiness uh, for secondary schools, those activities continue. Uh, we've been working in the same manner with our secondary sites as we have with our elementary sites up until this point. So the air and water quality uh, mitigations that we put in place are also in place in our secondary sites. Um, but we'll wait to finalize those classroom setups until staff returns during those transition days. And then we have the registration information to help us understand how many students we need to accommodate within a classroom. So culinary and wellness services, um, the probably the biggest change here between uh, element, or I'm sorry, elementary and secondary is the superintendent mentioned uh, the guidance does require daily documentation of seating during lunch. Uh, so our culinary staff will be working again with our individual schools to determine the best logistics for meal services in order to maintain that social distancing during lunch. I also want to reassure, reassure folks that will continue um, based on our resources to provide weekly meal boxes for students who remain in distance learning. Um, we are staffing that operation with many of our site-based staff. So right now we're working to identify what that weekly meal box schedule will look like. Um, and we, we do anticipate that that will continue and there'll still be some demand for that. Uh, transportation is probably from an operational perspective along with staffing, uh, the biggest area that we need to address. Uh, in the secondary guidance as it's currently written by MDE and MDH, we are to maintain a 50% capacity on buses for secondary students. Um, the same seating charts and ridership uh, would be maintained for contact tracing. Uh, but contact tracing will get uh, more complicated with our high school students utilizing Metro Transit. Uh, continue to require face coverings at all times and the uh, contractor providers that we do have working with us right now are required to have those same COVID plans in place. So we continue um, through our elementary implementation and as we look forward to secondary implementation to monitor those bus loads so we can continue to evaluate capacity. Um, one thing to note is currently the guidance for Metro Transit from the state is different than the guidance for uh, K-12, or I'm sorry, secondary schools. Where secondary schools, the guidance is 50% capacity on a school bus. 
Metro Transit is, is required currently to operate at 25% capacity. So we've reached out both to the state and to Metro Transit to try to work through some of these constraints that will be presented to us and are working um, to identify mitigations or special act actions that we can take to either increase our capacity based on the driver staffing that we have and that our contracted service providers have, um, or also to reduce demand. And I think Superintendent Graf uh, previously mentioned that we'll be rolling out an offer for mileage reimbursements for families who are entitled to school transportation and yet um, have the ability to transport their own children uh, and be compensated for that um, through the district. And then finally, uh, we continue to monitor um, where we are as it relates to in-person and the learning model by monitoring the COVID case data that Associate Cox has referenced earlier. Continued to consult with our regional support team, which has really been a very valuable asset for us as we've worked through this process and identified our guidance, as well as our advisory committee that we've been meeting with um, on a biweekly basis. So we'll continue to monitor how well we can operationalize these pieces, whether that's the personal protective equipment um, that we are providing to all of our staff, um, and in some cases, our students. Uh, staffing that uh, we've spoken about, the building read readiness, and then how transportation availability will, will impact some of our operations. And I think with that, I am turning it over to uh, Senior lead Leader Amy Fearing. Hey, good evening, everyone. Thanks, Senior Leader DeVette. Um, so for secondary in-person and distance learning considerations, uh, similar to elementary, uh, Minneapolis is a universal access district, but not a one-to-one, -one, meaning all students have access to age-appropriate technology at their school. So students who are returning in person who've been using a Minneapolis public school's technology um, device for distance learning will bring their device including the power cord adapter to school, but then back home each day. Because we do know that our families have been able to utilize that technology device to have better contact with the school. So we want that to continue. Uh, students who've been using personal technology at home, meaning they did not have a Minneapolis device, um, they'll continue to have access to a device at school though. So they won't need to bring their personal device to school. So at the school, we will have um, technology for them. Um, transition day is similar to elementary. Um, teachers and staff are allowed between two to five days between the learning models. So we recommend up to 12 hours of building directed time to complete professional development and training. And again, some might take more, some may take less, depending on the complexity of the building and the training that the staff would need. Um, the rest of the transition days should be consecutive as much as possible because we do want our staff to be engaged in planning and connecting with our families as much as possible. For uh, secondary students um, on site, five days a week learning, uh, three feet of distance required between classmates, six feet required from staff. Uh, there will be required to maintain face coverings at all times except during meals unless they have a health reason. Prescribed and limited student and staff movement around buildings, including a seating chart in the lunchroom. Uh, teachers for in-person learning may be different from current distance learning teachers, uh, similar to elementary, and may have online instruction even if the student is in the school building for classes taught only by one teacher in the school if that teacher must teach from home. Daily schedule. Uh, school schedules virtual and person should follow the uh, Minnesota Department of Education instructional requirements for minutes and all our contractual agreements. Our school leadership teams were strongly encouraging them to review any schedule changes to ensure that the schedules follow required instructional minutes for secondary student learning. Uh, we do strongly recommend uh, any changes to a student schedule should be communicated with the student and family and that should happen during that transition week. While there may be changes to class rosters and assigned teachers, distance learning instruction should follow the school's established distance learning schedule. Consistency of these scheduling guidelines will allow families to understand the difference between in-person and distance learning instruction and ensure equity of learning experiences across the state. 
Um, so in elementary school, we call them specialists. In secondary, we call them electives. So for electives, the building leader in collaboration with the school's leadership team should work closely on a schedule that allows students to continue participation in elective courses. A teacher who teaches an elective or a singleton course, this means the course happens one time during the day and only one teacher usually teaches or is qualified to teach that course. Um, so a teacher who teaches an elective or a singleton course may have to teach simultaneously in person and distance learning students at the same time. Again, in secondary, we do have licensing requirements um, for the graduation required classes as well as for our elective classes. So there will be instances where we'll have one teacher who's qualified to teach that one class. For itinerant teachers, these are teachers that would rotate among buildings. Uh, they will provide a blended model of intervention, both in person and through a virtual platform. Uh, they will be limited to accessing two buildings a day and they may need to access the PPE at those buildings. Uh, credit recovery. So we have two types of credit recovery happening and will be happening. So credit recovery ongoing is programming available at all high schools. These programs are individualized for each school using their teachers when possible. All classes are taught using appropriately licensed teachers because again, for secondary, for credit, the teachers need to be licensed in that area. Classes are provided asynchronously while having a synchronous component so students can work at their own pace and there's special education EL supports available. So that's ongoing. Anytime students can register for courses they need to recover credit. We will also be hosting Spring Break Academy, which would be April 5th through the 9th. So all core content courses will be offered. Uh, we really do focus on 12th grade because we want to make sure that we're supporting their graduation track. Um, we did do a pilot site um, for ninth grade uh, credit recovery during Winter Break Academy. We saw um, a lot of success at Edison, so we'll be expanding that for spring break, I believe, at Henry and South High. Teachers provide different, oh, <laughs> I didn't have it memorized, sorry. Uh, teachers provide differentiated and scaffolded instruction with focus on projects and individual instruction. And of course, even during our spring break academy, we will have specialized instruction available for English learner and special education students. Uh, just a quick update on athletics. Uh, Minneapolis Public Schools is maintaining no spectators at athletic events. Um, we will have live streaming winter sporting events that will continue. Some important factors to consider. Uh, staff needed for successful events cannot be required, but must, must opt in. This would include engineers, security, game workers, clock operators, etc. cetera. Uh, building engineers must disinfect high touch areas throughout and after the event. And advanced ticketing with spectator name, email, and phone number is required for contact mapping. Minneapolis Athletics will continue to monitor COVID-19 rates and work closely with MDH and will communicate any changes in the future. And resources and materials, so similar to elementary, we will be providing, we've actually bought and have received school supplies for secondary students, grade six, 12. As we know, students should not be sharing any type of material. So those are available for schools to then give to students. Um, this also includes distance learners, so they have access to materials as well. Uh, Minneapolis will continue to provide art and physical education supplies, um, kits and supplies for grades 6, 12. So our ordering was based on the number of students enrolled in those courses. So um, schools will have those available. Again, those will be for in-person and for distance learners. And now I'll turn it over to Senior Leader Moore. Hey, thank you, Amy. Uh, Similar to uh, our elementary uh, locations, uh, we will have mental health supports available at the secondary level, uh, continued uh, partnership for school-based mental health. Uh, we actually have now uh, mental health support specialists on board, and so they'll be available to support our students uh, with a focus also on culturally uh, specific uh, supports. Uh, we also continue to have a relationship with uh, CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, uh, this provides us with a national view of what types of supports um, are available across the nation. And so we're able to leverage uh, their knowledge as a, as a national collaborative. Uh, we have our equity and social emotional learning departments as well as our district mental health teams uh, to support our schools. And we also will continue to do morning meetings and, and closing circles. And, and these will become very critical as we're all aware, March 8th uh, marks the beginning of the Derek Chauvin trial. And so 
uh, it's very important that we provide an opportunity for both our adults and particularly our students to, to talk about what they're feeling uh, because we know how that impacts uh, their ability to engage in instruction. Uh, also, they've, they've been through a lot just generally um, as they're returning back to school. So we wanna be able to provide support for our students and give them an opportunity to express uh, how they're feeling. We also um, uh, will make sure that we have welcoming school environments. Uh, we will uh, continue to do adult uh, social emotional learning well-being activities uh, as well as community building. Uh, we will pay attention to uh, things such as student belonging and relationships, uh, trauma informed practices, both for our students uh, and being aware of how uh, trauma impacts our adults. Uh, we will treat continue similar to our elementary as students re-enter, treat the, the re-entry day as similar to a first day of school. So co-creating classroom agreements, rituals, routines, uh, continuing as mentioned with morning uh, and closing circles. Uh, we will also um, uh, put together building-wide welcoming plans. So each school will have a building-wide welcoming plan um, and with an emphasis on uh, uh, being able to make a, a personal phone call to our families at uh, Stillwater Elementary, welcoming them to, um, to in-person and, and also to check in to see how distance learning is going. So uh, you know, one of the things that we've really recognized during distance learning is we have seen more engaged parents um, and, and so we definitely want to continue to capitalize on that and take the lessons learned um, and have that move back into um, our, our classrooms as we get back in person. I want to shift to um, assessment. Uh, so uh, we are in the midst at the elementary level of access testing, that's uh, assessment, assessing for our English language learners that uh, identifies growth uh, in language acquisition. Uh, and so per guidance, we will I continue to do this work uh, at our secondary level in the windows from February 16th to April 16th. Uh, we have about 6,000 students in grades K-12 that will have the opportunity to take the assessment of our multilingual department as well as the research evaluation assessment accountability department, working with EL leads and testing coordinators uh, to make sure that each site has what they need. Uh, and so again, these assessments will be online, uh, be given to small groups of 10, at the kindergarten level, which isn't relevant here, but it'll be one-to-one. -one. Um, assessments administered by EL teachers, test coordinators, and special ed managers. Um, and so for those that remain in distance learning, we will provide transportation. Um, we will be uh, uh, providing transportation. Uh, at this point, about 50% of families have opted out. I wanted to share that because we do always communicate with our families and give them the option of opting out of this assessment. Um, and so while this is an important assessment, we do want to value um, the, the um, concerns of parents, families, um, as they're particularly those in distance learning as they're trying to navigate having a child come in person for the assessment. This is an in-person assessment. Uh, similar to that, we're um, per MDE, Minnesota Department of Education. We also must uh, be complete our MCA, Minnesota Conference of Assessment. Uh, testing. And so this has to be in person. This impacts about 20,000 students, grades 3 through 12. Uh, we are going to administer the assessment April 12th to May 7th. Uh, and so, uh, again, this is an in-person assessment. Those that are in distance learning, uh, we will identify opportunities for students to be transported to take the assessment in person. Again, uh, respecting the parent's right, we will provide information regarding opting out that this assessment is not meeting their needs, uh, particularly during uh, COVID-19 and the situation that we're in. Uh, so we will be communicating uh, in the next week uh, to families about the MCA, uh, finding out uh, those that remain in distance, um, finding out uh, their intent to, to take the assessment. And so at this point, I will turn it over to um, uh, Executive Director uh, Julie. Julie Schultz Brown. Thanks, Senior Officer Moore. Uh, welcome. Good evening, Board Directors and Superintendent. I'm just going to give you some highlighted dates. You'll see this graphic on social media and in a variety of other places, which helps you understand approximately who's going back when and when they have time off of school. You'll see Monday, March 22nd, it's largely special students receiving special ed. 
Monday, April 12th, we have all grade, all uh, general ed students, nine through 12, as well as remaining students receiving special ed. And then finally on Monday, April 19th, you can see that we've got um, all students in grades six through eight, including at our K-8 students. On the far right, you'll see a note about when students have time off for the transition time for the teachers and schools to prepare for the return of the students. On the next page, we'll see, I'm not gonna go through each of these, but I want, cause you can read them at your leisure, but I wanna highlight two dates particularly. On the second bullet, February 24th through 9th, we're going to be reaching out to families who, based on their cultural community, once again, to help them with um, filling out the registration form that will be coming out tomorrow to all families. It will be, um, it's very similar to the last one, but I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. But we'll be reaching out and helping families for whom it might not be second nature. And then I'd like to highlight March 6th because we will be holding another virtual family Q&A on a Saturday morning as we did uh, for the elementary grades. And we hope that you'll be joining us for that. Um, additional dates here have all been shown on the previous slide, but this uh, one thing I do want to bring to your attention too is you'll note that on April 12th, 13th, 19th, and 20th, we are bringing back the youngest of those grades for one day by themselves, not the youngest, but the lowest grade. So grade nine is coming back on April 12th and we'll have a day in the schools by themselves and then 10 through 12 arrive the next day, April 13th. On April 19th, grade six will return for one day by themselves and then their older peers will return on April 20th. We'll go into that in more detail as we get closer. This is again what the registration form looks like. It will be open from February 24th through March 9th. Um, and then so people will be able to come on March 6th also and ask questions. And if they haven't registered, they'll be able to continue to do that. We did this, let me just say one thing. We just did, we did the form a little differently this year, this time. So we think it will load more quickly and shouldn't have so many, so much trouble, which we, we, we listened and we heard that that was a problem. So, and then um, the next slide, as you said, as you saw, is just things we're hoping that the schools will do to get to families because we know that schools, families are most interested in hearing directly from the people that they trust at their schools. Thank you. And Superintendent, I believe you're leading us in questions and answers. Thank you. Um, so board directors, again, tonight, we wanted to provide you with uh, some immediate information regarding our return to in-person learning for our secondary students. Um, as mentioned, we will have information going out tomorrow to both staff as well as families around the application process for return to in-person learning. So we will provide a more uh, current update at our next board meeting, but wanted to address any possible questions you might have this evening. Chair Ellison. Thank you, Superintendent and staff. I feel like that was a very detailed presentation. So board members, if you have any questions or comments, please raise your hand please use the raise hand feature or let um, Director Arneson know you'd like to speak in the assembly room. Chair Allison, we have some comments here, but I'll let you, um, if there's people on I the have no hands. Then. I have okay. no hands, so we'll start in the assembly room. Okay, Director oh. Catrini. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, maybe I missed this as I stepped out to uh, use the restroom. Did we discuss uh, the issue of, of um, uh, spring break and um, families leaving to go to spring break on spring break outside of Minnesota, um, traveling, flying, and then returning, and then either doing distant learning for a period of time? Um, has that been discussed this evening in the uh, presentation? Director Caprini, thank you for the question. Um, we, we did not discuss the travel uh, kind of considerations that I think people have been alluding to around spring break. Um, I can ask Associate Superintendent Cox to give some guidance. Uh, again, there are, there are um, considerations that are put forth obviously for um, travel uh, that Minneapolis Public Schools you know, does not manage. I mean, those are the uh, Center for Disease Control, um, but I will ask Associate Superintendent Cox to 
to give kind of the um, information that we've provided to, to families at this time. Thank you, Superintendent and Director Cabrini. We will be sending out a message to all of our staff and families the first week of March, sharing resources and information about travel from both the Minnesota Department of Health as well as the Centers for Disease Control. Um, if we are alerted that a family, um, that a, a family alerts us that their student has traveled or if a staff member alerts us that they have traveled and feel the need to quarantine, we will then send their information on to the Minneapolis Health Department who will provide us direction on the length of that quarantine and if it's needed. Well, thank you, so I just have uh, one more uh, question. Um, did, and did I hear that um, with returning students six through 12th grade that um, there will be a chance that some students won't have the same teacher uh, in person um, or some students may not have the same teacher in distant learning in six through 12, similar to what's occurred at the elementary level. I know that there was some issues um, with folks in regards to how many uh, students teachers were teaching, but it seems to have kind of leveled itself out to some degree. There's a, a rhythm going from what I'm, the feedback that I'm receiving from parents um, and even some staff. So I'm wondering if that would be the same case for six through 12th grade, thank you. Director Caprini, uh, again, to just make sure I'm clarifying the question. Um, so as, as we had in the elementary um, schools, we had some transitions with students who were in distance learning, moving to in-person, and in that they no longer had the same teacher, as well as some of those students who remained in distance learning no longer had the same teacher. And that is expected uh, to, to occur at the secondary level also. It's our preference to minimize and to not have those transitions happen if we can avoid it but certainly just looking at how complex the, the secondary level uh, high school is with the certification and licensure, that it would, um, I would be very surprised if that did not happen, but it's our hope to minimize those types of transitions if at all possible. Thank you, I'm, I'm glad to hear that we're gonna really try and work hard to minimize that because the percentage of students that are not doing well, that are very credit um, deficient and uh, need those resource, those, uh, connections with their teachers that they have been going or been having every day, I think is really important as well as I'm sure everyone in this room does. I just wanted to preface that, that that's, these are teenagers, these are high school students. Um, many of them are um, preparing to go to the next level. So I just wanna needle nose down in there so that we're able to reach those kids. Thank you. The other, the other thing I would add, and this is um, again, part of the, the transition timeline is that we would be looking at this occurring at the fourth quarter. Um, so you have a, in some cases, a natural break with classes or transitioning for um, learning experiences at the, at the quarter break. So that is also part of the consideration. Thank you. Um, student Representative Deborah Meskel. Yes, thank you. Um, I was just wondering if there would be any increased support for the freshman class. Um, I know that they're mentioning of just creating you know, rituals and kind of creating like support for students coming back and, you know, the the change from, you know, going from virtual to in-person that a lot of freshmen have never even been in their school building before and haven't really had a chance to connect either with their teachers or their fellow students. So I was wondering if there'd also be increased support for freshmen. Chair Ellison, uh, student representative Gabriel Meskel, thank you for the, the question, uh, the consideration um, those discussions have started. Obviously, what we're, we're looking at for the freshmen uh, students who would be returning to in-person, um, as well as our sixth grade students will be going uh, to in-person, perhaps for the first time in that building. Um, we're really looking to have our, our schools provide that welcoming environment. Um, similarly to what we did at the elementary level, we had teachers reaching out um, making contact, um, staff reaching out, making contact. Uh, at the elementary level, I know we had videos that were created. So really trying to um, leverage those uh, school-based kind of uh, opportunities for connecting prior to that first day, as well as the consideration at this time is being given to have just the freshman students in person uh, who, who choose to be in person to have that first day by themselves. Uh, to become familiar with uh, the building, the routine, the rituals, um, before we bring in the remaining um, high school students. And the same approach at the, the middle school level. 
um, but certainly know that our associate superintendents um, and their work with the building principals will be having those conversations. And then looking at also the timing of that, um, as mentioned already over spring break, we will have a spring break academy. So any of those students who have uh, specific needs or maybe um, more essential needs um, could take advantage of that spring break, spring break academy opportunity uh, to help become familiar with some of those routines and rituals. Even though that will be um, virtual, um, there's an extra opportunity for connection and that transition support. But appreciate your, your thoughtfulness around that. And certainly um, we would um, welcome some, some partnering ideas with either you or um, perhaps the citywide uh, student government considering uh, those interests. Representative Deborah Meskel, um, Director Inns. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Superintendent Graff, uh, Senior Officer Sullivan, um, I had a question about um, uh, staffing and accommodations. Um, uh, I'm wondering what our current uh, process and criteria are for providing accommodations to our staff um, based on uh, state guidance and, um, you know, other criteria that may or may not be. And then I have a, a sort of a follow-up comment. I, you know, I, I asked uh, about, a, I don't know, a month or so ago about the accommodations and uh, consistency with respect to our accommodations. And I'm wondering what we're doing now to ensure that we're, we have a process that is, uh, um, good to our employees. Um, I know that, uh, um, you know, as a, as a public school district, um, our, I believe, and, a pub, you know, we have public employees that are working for the benefit of the public good. And I, I believe that, um, you know, that the ethics that go into um, public service are different maybe than private industry. And, I, you know, I'd like you to comment on that. Um, we've talked about a little bit the, um, the guidance that we received from the governor with regard to our employees and the criteria with respect to granting accommodations. And, you know, I know that um, uh, we want to do our best. Um, and, you know, I feel like sometimes, you know, we're given instructions um, and, you know, in education, as a teacher myself, you know, we're expected to do a certain thing. And that doesn't mean that we do that like bare minimum. Um, we have we have a sort of a higher moral authority or moral calling, I would say, um, to treat our employees well. And so I'm wondering how that goes into providing safety to our employees during the pandemic. And, you know, when we talk about how we're going to staff up now for high schools and junior highs as well, um, how that's impacted our um, ability to grant accommodations to employees um, based on their health needs. So uh, that's a mouthful, but I think you get the gist. Yeah, um, Chair Ellison, uh, Director Inns, thank you for the question. I know this has been uh, an important discussion that's happened both uh, within the district and in the lives and the homes of uh, many of our employees. And so it's something that we are very mindful of and wanna make sure that everyone understands we, we have very clear guidelines around accommodations for family medical leave, as well as Americans with Disability Act. And so we are uh, very well aware of what those processes are and are adhering to those in compliance with um, the requirements of those two those two um, areas. The third area that I think has become a little more um, challenging, and you alluded to it in the governor's executive order, uh, it's, it's two parts. It's uh, you know the return to in-person work part of it, and then it's uh, the the um, identification of being at a high risk within um, your household. And in both of those cases. Um, we've established uh, an opportunity for people to request accommodations and provide us with that information that uh, kind of a, um, shares enough detail with us so we can look at that in a very formal manner as well. 
and then make the determination um, you know, as to how that uh, support can be provided or not. So I think that's something that in, in this pandemic and in through the governor's executive order that um, has created a little bit of challenge for us, but I, I know in the work that we've done over the last uh, several weeks with providing that clarity to employees, um, both the employees who are helping uh, staff navigate the process as well as um, the staff who have to um, make determinations as to what their needs are as an employee of the district, um, we've been able to clear that up. I will ask Senior Officer Sullivan to maybe give a little more detail on how we've been um, working through that, uh, specifically with the governor's executive order and what that means for the return to in-person communication that's going out tomorrow. Um, but I, I would agree and recognize that you know our our employees, as well as our students, uh, health and safety are paramount for us. And so uh, you're right, it is an obligation we have, a, a moral and ethical, ethic, ethical obligation to, to do our best to accommodate that um, as, you know, um, as much as possible, given, given where we are as, a, as an organization um, operating um, in-person learning. So Senior Officer Sullivan, can you maybe share a little bit more information on that process? Spe uh, yeah, specifically absolutely. looking at um, the uh, return to in-person for secondary? Yeah, so at least as we move forward with the return to in-person work for our secondary staff, we are providing information on accommodations and leaves, and that includes um, FMLA, ADA, as well as leaves under the governor's orders. We are treating each case case by case, uh, doing that determination in individually, uh, which is important, and making sure we're following the law with which each step of the way, um, working with our school leaders as well to see where we can accommodate. I think it's really important with all three of those. So again, it's, it's an individual by individual, individual process, um, an interactive process with our school leaders. Um, I, I would also say uh, two things are also important. We are also looking at the governor's orders, which says if you can work from home, you should work from home. So which is not necessarily a formal accommodation, but if, if you do not have duties to do on site, you should be working from home. So we're continuing to stress that with, with our school leaders and department heads as well, that if there are not duties to be performed on site, we should be sending employees home to do their work from home. Um, so the last thing I would add is I think vaccines are a really important part of this as well. We're finding more and more as our staff are able to get vaccinated. Um, those accommodations, they're, they're um, asking to rescind those accommodations. Um, so that's a trend we're seeing as well. So as we as we build out our, our list and try to get those opportunities, as Senior Officer DeVette mentioned, for vaccination appointments, um, we've included our staff on accommodations and leaves as well to ensure they're, they have the opportunity to do that. So we're watching it all together. Um, but again, the accommodations and leaves component is a really critical piece of this return to work process. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Director Arneson. Any questions in the room? Yes, Director Elamine. Thank you, thank you again. A um, couple questions that I have in regards to the academic side. We um, already know that our children are falling behind. And so when I think about the MCAs that will be presenting to them to take and how much stress that puts on the family. And I know it is an option to opt out. Um, I'm just concerned about the amount of time that we are putting into that, that could be put into our children actually doing that um, recovery of credits. And then how, what are we doing in regards to those students that have fallen behind? I know we have the Spring Break Academy, but that week is not enough um, for our students to be able to catch up on what they've missed during this pandemic. And so I, I'm just really concerned about the academic piece and how we are going to help our families to um, get back to where they need to be and what are we planning for our summer for our families as well. Uh, Director Alamine, thank you so much for your question. I think um, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that I share your concern around our learning um, and, and how that has been significantly impacted over the last 11 months. Um, the idea of the, the MCAs and the, the time and commitment that we have for that is one that I think um, you know, last spring was, was recognized in, at the start of the pandemic and that's why we didn't have that requirement. However, I know recently the administration, uh, the current administration under President Biden has said that they will move forward with the, the MCAs. Um, 
We did ask for uh, an extension to administer the MCAs because of the layering that we have with other testing requirements in our access testing. Um, and so I don't know what the outcome will be of, with that, uh, but it is something that we have, have asked uh, of uh, our, our state and we'll um, certainly let you know if we get more details on that. Regarding the, the plan for this summer, um, I'm gonna ask Dr. Fearing to speak a little bit to what we are proposing right now. Um, we have been developing kind of a, a, a summer school model, a consideration for that. You know, this is, this is unlike any other year, obviously. And one of, the, one of the considerations or a couple of the considerations that we are mindful of is that our students have been operating in this sequestered kind of space for the last 11 months of virtual learning. And, and we're optimistic and hopeful that we'll be able to move to uh, in-person through the summer as well. And knowing that and knowing what the summer brings in, in Minnesota, um, there, there will be some challenges, I think, to some degree with making sure that our students are still taking advantage of those opportunities. We wanna make sure that they are you know, well-rounded opportunities that keep them engaged, keep them um, socially and, and emotionally um, experiencing what they need to experience, as well as the academic foundation and addressing that learning loss. So I think those are all the, the considerations we're giving and trying to develop those um, learning experiences. But I'll ask Dr. Fearing to maybe highlight some of the work that we have been um, developing right now to hopefully kick off not only our summer offerings, but then also continuing that into the fall. I think that's the other thing where we know that, you know, six weeks of uh, summer learning may help uh, with, you know, um, regression, but it won't make up what is needed for 11 months. And I think that's something we have to be very clear about as well. Um, if, if, there is, if there is a need for, um, you know, extended support, we want to make sure we can build that in for next school year, if at all possible. So Dr. Fearing, could you please share some of that? Sure, and I'd like to highlight just a few things currently this spring. Um, so thanks for the question. We, we do want to, you know, have the credit recovery options, either the online that's happening consistently and the Spring Break Academy, but we also want to make sure that we're supporting students so they don't get behind and land in the space that they need credit recovery. So um, two things. So one is that we're pursuing um, some work-based learning pilots um, at three of our high schools, because we do know that some of our students have to work during this time. And we want to be able to acknowledge that, but also see if they can gain some credits based on their work experience. So our college and career department is working with our career and tech ed department to create some opportunities yet this spring for those students. Um, we just have to go through some processing and make sure the teachers are licensed in the correct area so students can get credit as they're off um, doing their work. Um, the other opportunity that we are kicking up, actually I just got the email today, is that we're offering a weekend and evening uh, student drop-in support. So in combination with all of our academic divisions, so this would include Indian Education, the Office of Black Student Achievement, Teaching and Learning, um, College and Career Readiness, um, that we would be able to offer some virtual drop-in sessions for students. So again, it, it could be academic, they need some support. It could be just a space for them to come and have a conversation or meet with the support staff that they've known uh, through our OBSA or Indian Ed programs. Um, so we are right now recruiting staff and then we'll set up a schedule and message that out so our students can take part in that. So again, that's kind of in that preventative area. As we move into the summer, um, I won't list all of the <laughs> different things that we have, but I'll just highlight a few, some of the major ones. The first one is that we want to expand our high fives. So currently in the summer, we offer high five programming to current, currently enrolled high five students. What we want to do is expand it to all Minneapolis um, enrolled kindergartners for next fall so that they can get a head start this summer as well. Um, so in order to do that, you know, we had to look at spacing and looking at transportation, looking at staffing, but it's our intention to be able to increase the numbers of our uh, rising kindergartners um, this summer and to allow that experience. Um, the next big thing that we have going on this summer is through our um, targeted services, which provides the academic supports as well as our Gems and Guys uh, program. So our targeted services, which is uh, kindergarten through seventh grade, um, those, um, that program is gonna have a literacy and math focus. 
So right now working the extended learning department that runs summer schools, working with our teaching and learning department to ensure that we have literacy and math curriculum that is um, at each grade level to really ensure students are getting either the gaps filled in that they missed during the school year or getting them prepared for the next level going into the next school year. Um, and then for gems and guys, because we know that's something that a lot of our students like to participate in this summer, um, those courses are all standards aligned. So again, if a student chooses gems and guys, they'll continue to get grade level standards because um, that's been interwoven to ensure that we're catching those students as well. Um, we'll have uh, in-person um, opportunity, but we'll also continue to hold a virtual space for gems and guys. So students who need to stay home can also engage in summer programming. Um, and then I would say the last, um, the last thing I'd like to highlight uh, for summer school is really the um, community education youth enrichment. We'll have um, all of their programming going. We will be planning for in-person, but again, if we have to move back to distance learning for any reason, um, we'll have that as a backup plan. Um, I do want to say that um, two things that we have incorporated into our summer programming that's different than previous years. One is that we have, um, we're including counselors and social workers at all of our summer school sites so that we can support students in that way. We also will have mental health supports uh, than, more than we've um, usually had in the past at our summer school sites with you know, pre-K 12. Um, and then also having more um, health supports um, through um, LPNs and health service staff so we can ensure that programming continues in a safe and healthy way. Um, and then I'll just highlight the special education um, component of summer school. So um, it's, a, it's the expansion of cluster sites um, for um, ESY extended school year, and then expanding the time that students have access to extended school year. So again, being able to do that and work with those students and uh, having an inclusion model of our English learners in our regular summer programming and hiring additional English or ESL staff to support those students. So hopefully that's enough. <laughs> yes, thank Perfect. you. Thank you for your response. Thank you so much. Um, Director Saria. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question uh, is, uh, well, I have several questions, but uh, to begin with the access testing. I know, I know that Senior Moore mentioned something about our families are being communicated uh, to have the option to opt out. Um, how is that taking place? Is it a phone call or an email or just explain to me because I am actually uh, the guardian of uh, uh, a male student and I have not been communicated of that option. Director Serio, thank you for the question. Senior Officer Moore, would you um, please share a little more detail on the process for the access testing communication? Right. The, the expectation is for the uh, English language learner teacher to reach out uh, both with the date and, and in that communication to offer the option uh, for the uh, opt out. So it's a reminder um, that that uh, regarding the schedule and then at that point uh, communication that you have the ability to opt out or not. So um, certainly uh, you know, I do appreciate it if that did not occur and we will follow up and, and ensure that it happens. Thank you. And now another question um, regarding the Spring Break Academy. Is that something that every high school is going to be offering? And because I know there's going to be like a, a registration period, correct? Is it going to be based on from high school to high school or are they going to have a protocol to follow, just expand a little bit more. I'm not clear on that. Dr. Fearing, would you mind um, speaking to the specifics of how that registration mm -hmm. and those offerings occur for Spring Break Academy? Sure. So for Spring Break Academy, the school counselors usually are the ones that um, work with the students and they complete an online registration form. Mm -hmm. What's important about that conversation is that students are registering for a specific course or credit that they need. So if they need, you know, even within a course like world history, they might only need quarter one or quarter three. So really working with the school counselor to make sure they get that quarter. And then um, Spring Break Academy staff are hired per licensure, per the, the amount of students district-wide that are needed. 
So again, um, for Spring Break Academy, it will be virtual, so they won't be reporting on site, um, but they will be getting synchronous time with the teacher, and then they'll also have asynchronous work on to, to complete their credit. We will have um, support for English learners and um, students with special needs so that they can also have the opportunity to recover credit um, as necessary. Um, so the teachers teaching Spring Break Academy are not necessarily that student's teacher at their home school, but they're teachers that have applied to work um, and they have the correct licensure and they're given a roster of students. Those students log in and then uh, virtually complete um, their work. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. And uh, the last question, um, how is our leadership showing up uh, like for, you know, our families, our students, or our principals? Uh, how does the final walkthrough look like? Are we going to have uh, the associate superintendents present? Just extend a little bit more on that. And that's my final question. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Director Cirillo. If I could have Senior Officer DeVette um, explain the, the walkthrough considerations that we do for all of our schools. Yes, I'm happy to. Um, so we have a building readiness checklist that the facilities staff has been working through um, since late October. So there's continual walkthroughs happening by those quality assurance and building operations supervisors and the uh, director of plan operations as we approach um, the time when staff return during those transition days and we can do finalize the setup for classrooms then there is a schedule that the principal is invited to attend the walkthrough along with um, the facilities leadership and finalize that building checklist uh, against the preparation activities that we've been making so a lot of support happening in sites and in buildings um, with our facility staff. Our associate superintendents have been involved in reviewing the checklist, helping um, assist their principals and building safety teams on working through many of the pieces that, um, such as some of the social distancing with the size of some of our classrooms that might, might be more challenging. So working to help, help identify ways and means to mitigate some of those challenges that we just kind of uh, might, might not be able to see our way through, um, kind of on the ground if you would. Uh, but that support is coming from the associates uh, for that piece as well. Thank you very much. Director Arneson. Uh, thank you, I finish it up. I think from uh, this room, I, I, I just have one question and I'm, it's okay if we don't wanna answer that tonight, but uh, I'm thinking about staffing, a different, a different sort of staffing question than what Director Inns was asking. Well, actually, first I wanna just acknowledge and appreciate uh, Director Alameen and the superintendent's comments um, and appreciating that the MCA is perhaps not a decision. We may not have made the same decision. It is not our decision to make and we perhaps would have gone a different direction. Uh, but uh, so I'm appreciating the challenge that um, the MCA is kind of putting us in this year and recognizing that, um, it, just recognizing the challenge and it, feeling a little frustrated about that myself. But my question is really more about staffing a different direction than what Director Inns was bringing and just, just a, um, noting and appreciating that we are redeploying uh, staff from different job descriptions, trying to like fill a very real shortage. We need more staff because we are trying to do kind of two different modes of education at the same time. We have people who have accommodations who can't be there, who have more limitations. We have people who are out sick. And so I'm just, um, I'm noting that it's probably going to be get worse, not better, as we have more buildings that we're trying to open. And I definitely heard Senior Officer um, Sullivan's co optimistic comment that we are hiring and working to fill staff, but I'm just acknowledging that that's probably actually pretty difficult. And um, I'm thinking about that. So I know we're coming back on the 9th, and so I don't really need to talk about that now, but um, maybe something to talk about a little bit more about a very real staffing issue, and maybe consideration if we have part-time staff that we are perhaps considering authorizing, allowing um, allowing principals to hire them full-time, especially they probably have other job duties that they're trying to do as well. So just trying to think about kind of some concrete, like really how, if we're gonna run out of people at some point. Yeah, Director Arneson, uh, thank you for your comment around the staffing. It is something that we've been wrestling with and, and as we've 
entered into the in-person for elementary. We've, um, like, like noted already, we've you know redeployed and reassigned and supported um, schools in different ways than we have uh, in the past. Um, so we will have more information as we work through our uh, return to in-person notification and get uh, information coming back from employees. Um, so we can probably give a, a better sense of yeah. of our status of things in March. Um, right, and I don't need the specifics of who or whatever. I just know, like, in general, we're going to have some people who can return to work and some people who can't, and we're going to have substitute needs, and, you know, I just in general, I know, and I know that, that we're running out of people to redeploy. So just wanting to kind of think about that. Uh, with that, Chair Ellison, I know we have a, a resolution here to... Uh, to vote on here tonight, and uh, as uh, I'm going to make the motion, but first I'll just say that we were here just kind of a few weeks ago, actually, with a s very similar topic, and I just, I want to acknowledge that this really remains an emotional topic for, for many people, and that it really presents conflict for us between health and academics, and we're still in a space even though we've been doing now this for a couple of weeks, it's still, it's a difficult space for us to be in and it's a difficult space for educators to be in. And I think we were all a little surprised by the governor's announcement, um, but nevertheless, he did offer some um, very pretty clear expectations and some clear timelines. And yet we were also on this path already. So it feels like a little maybe less surprising or perhaps, um, it, it's out there, right? But I think that um, it doesn't necessarily make it easier or less complicated. In fact, uh, as we acknowledge here tonight, there are more complications sometimes uh, with, this, with this next step. But I do appreciate the information here tonight and um, there was a number of pieces, very specific pieces of information that uh, did really impress me here tonight, but I'm not gonna get into that. We're gonna keep talking about this and we have a few weeks out. Um, so with that, I'm gonna move the uh, resolution that we are acknowledging uh, the governor's orders and uh, would ask the superintendent to continue to plan for in-person learning for six through 12 students. Thank you, thank you, um, Director Arneson. We, we all heard last week Governor Walls announcing his expectation that schools have an in-person option available for secondary schools. We just heard superintendent and his team um, talk about the plan that's been gone, begun. So we have a motion. Um, can I get a second with last name for the record? Second, Polly. Thank you. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Um, if there's any discussion, please raise your hand to be recognized. I have no hands, Director Arneson. No. Thank you. Um, Kirk Polly, will you please call the roll on the resolution supporting an option for in-person learning for secondary students? Director Arneson. Aye. Director Alamine. Yes. Director Ali. Yes. Director Surio. Yes. Director Enns. Yes. Director Jordan. Yes. Director Caprini. Aye. Director Polly is a yes, Chair Allison. Yes, thank you. That motion carries and the resolution is approved. That concludes the special business portion for the evening. Um, Director Arneson, would you please move to adjourn to our committee of the whole meeting, please? So moved. Second, Caprini. Thank you, a motion to adjourn the special business meeting has been moved and seconded. Will the clerk please call the roll? Director Arneson. Aye. Director Alamine. Yes. Director Ali. Yes. Director Cerillo. Yes. Director Enns. Yes. Director Jordan. Yes. Director Caprini. Aye. Director Polly is yes, Chair Ellison. Yes, thank you. That motion is approved and the special business meeting is adjourned. I will now call to order our February 23rd, 2021 Committee of the Whole meeting. Please let the record reflect that the same members are in attendance as we're at our just adjourned special business meeting. Um, I'm gonna note that it's now eight o'clock. We're gonna continue until probably as maybe as late as 8.45. Um, and we just have one item for the portion of this meeting. Um, last meeting we last meeting we ended a little early when we were talking about special education literacy um, was cut off due to time. I will note 
However, the directors did send questions via email after the meeting and those um, responses were provided. Um, we are now going to move to an update on the comprehensive district design implementation. Superintendent Graff, could you please go ahead? Thank you, thank you Chair Ellison. Um, well, I know we don't have um, much time. I, I do wanna honor our commitment to the board to providing ongoing uh, updates on the implementation of our comprehensive district design. Despite all the work you've heard discussed this evening, um, as well as the ongoing work of the district, I don't want anyone here or the public to think that we've put the comprehensive district design implementation on the shelf. We are continuing to move ahead with that planning work. And so uh, for tonight, I would like to ask Senior Officer Moore to highlight some of the ongoing work um, that is continuing. Senior Officer Moore, I'll turn it over to you. Superintendent uh, Chair Allison, uh, members of the board. You know, I was just reflecting um, about uh, the presentation tonight, but about eight years ago, we used to have our Committee of the Halls and our board meetings go till midnight. Uh, and so um, certainly we've come a long way, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, starting to get a little sleepy. It's almost, uh, I'm at eight o'clock, so I'm getting older, older and wiser here in Minneapolis Public Schools. I uh, want to share with all of you um, just a, a, a reminder about our conference of district design um, in that it, it is an attempt to, uh, and I think we all agree it's a bold effort uh, to ensure that every student is able to get uh, the quality education that they deserve, uh, that they have access to quality programming regardless of zip code. And so uh, this is our opportunity. So thank you for the opportunity to be able to provide an update to all of you and to the public about progress that we've made. Just a reminder, uh, substantial benefits. I mean, as we've made an intention out, intentionally um, reinvested dollars into the classroom uh, as we've moved it away from transportation. We've put more dollars in the classroom. Uh, we do expect our boundary changes to support a system of stronger schools. Uh, we, we expect to see fewer racially identifiable schools, schools with 80% or more, uh, for reduced lunch and under enrolled schools. Uh, we're starting to see some uh, early signs of that. Uh, we've revised our enrollment placement practices through our EDIA. Uh, we've also, uh, you know, because as we've reduced routes as a result of the conference of district design and gone to more of a community school model, uh, we do expect to have uh, less needs, less routes, less complex routes. Uh, and so that we anticipate that will improve transportation quality. Uh, we centralize our magnets. Our magnets are more accessible to more varieties of, of people throughout the district. Uh, we've been able to invest into, into programming for our magnets, again, shifting dollars from transportation uh, more towards programming. I think our schools are already seeing the benefits of that, our, our magnet schools. Uh, culture and climate framework uh, to directly address reasons why families are leaving the district and perhaps have a chance to talk about that bit as we talk about the second half of the, of the presentation when we get into enrollment. Uh, but we know that our families are leaving primarily, families of color, uh, for uh, culture and climate, uh, feeling respected uh, based upon who they are, um, and safety and academic rigor. So those are all items that we've been discussing um, over the past uh, three or more months. Uh, we, had, we will see an intensified your capital improvement plan uh, that, that will be presented to you. Actually, that was approved uh, last year, but substantial investments uh, in areas of the city, targeted investments. Um, of course, realigning priorities to our four priorities, funding to our priorities. Uh, and just uh, in particular, additional benefits to, to Northside uh, Minneapolis students. So, so, so acknowledging the Hall, Bethune, and Franklin are becoming magnets uh, with substantial investments. So we're, we're in, uh, investing in um, programming at North High uh, North High um, has, has been growing their enrollment. I, I recall years ago when their enrollment was actually 300 students. Uh, we're anticipating North High uh, enrollment now. Uh, their freshman class will be 190, uh, which is substantially higher than they've had in, in years past. Uh, we've committed to a Hmong language and culture strand for our Hmong International Academy to Olson to Henry, so we strengthen the pathway uh, for our Hmong families. Um, and, and just in general, we've stabilized and balanced enrollment. Uh, which is what you'll also see. And so here's a list of, of critical investments. 
uh, you're able to see those recommendations, but obviously we're uh, you know, developing our climate framework. We'll talk a bit about that in upcoming meetings. Uh, we're doubling down on our teacher of color recruitment and retention efforts, uh, including uh, teacher pathways, trying to get more of our high school students interested in the teaching profession, particularly our, our high school um, students of color. Uh, we've been able to uh, make, make some changes in our teacher contract. In particular, a restorative practices is now becoming uh, working and there's a memorandum of agreement ensuring that we're training all of our staff and restorative practices. Uh, so that is the approach to engagement uh, that we have in the district. We have some layoff protections at our high poverty schools. Um, we reallocated resources. You see the list here uh, aligned to our priorities. So magnet schools, mental health, um, equity training for all. I believe I'll be presenting a plan to you in the coming months regarding equity training. Um, early literacy focused on K2, early grade levels, fifth grade music, regardless of zip code. Uh, focus on STEM, focus on advanced courses, uh, strengthening the middle school programming, uh, with ensuring that um, world language is, is a part of every student's experience as, as regards of zip code. And then there's additional investments in our career and technical education program. So uh, benefits and, and investments align to those benefits. Here's a timeline. Uh, and this is the same timeline that we do share with our principals. Uh, we do provide updates every month of, of how progress is going and also what to expect uh, in honor of them. You know, that we have a, a really strong set of principals who are managing a lot right now in terms of reopening schools, but they're also committed to ensuring the CDD conference district design is moving forward. Uh, so uh, the, the timeline, so we are in the midst of budget allocations. Um, and, and so your budget tie out, we're having those discussions with principals. Um, in March, uh, and this will actually be the second week in March, uh, uh, letters will go out to families uh, regarding placements. So we've had families apply uh, to both magnets and in some cases out of area enrollment. And so parents in the next, uh, in the first week, second week in March, will get letters indicating uh, whether or not they are able to get into their first or second choices. Uh, March 5th, uh, we still go through our budget tie-out process. Uh, moving down, I think uh, as you move into April, oops, sorry, uh, as you move into April, um, you know, we're really getting into uh, school-based transition events, April, May. Uh, this is where the work of the climate framework really begins. And, um, you know, the hope is that we have our, our students in person uh, during that period of time. And uh, we're starting to engage more with our communities about uh, building our new communities that we expect to see 21-22, new academic communities. Uh, and then there's a HR internal transfer process, um, and ultimately the budget's approved. But there's a, a series of steps that are occurring, uh, and programming is being developed uh, each of these months. So here's just an update by department. Um, first, with uh, academics, uh, uh, you know, we are progressing in terms of our world language um, programming and ensuring that uh, programming is aligned with our enrollment changes. Uh, we're in the process of completing our climate framework, and I'll just share with you that uh, we're utilizing our families through and students through parent and youth evaluation. Uh, we're actually they're actually out collecting data now. Uh, I think they'll have that project completed uh, in early March, uh, getting more feedback from our community regarding our climate framework uh, and ways in which we should measure uh, some of the items that we're identifying we want our climate to look like. Our parent and youth uh, evaluators are really making it tangible for us. We also are, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, we're also uh, uh, continue to do our department planning, uh, aligning our department plans such our district priorities. Um, and, and so the climate framework is, is progressing. Uh, our communications department has been working diligently uh, on the school enrollment timeline to increase our virtual choice marketing. We've had a CDD fair. We've done communication with our various families. Um, you know, in spite of the pandemic, I, I want to applaud the communications department and the work they've done uh, with, with getting out the, the communication regarding choices. And you'll see uh, some of the fruits of their labor uh, in a bit. Uh, create distribute school recommendations. Uh, human resource department um, has been working to uh, 
uh, proposed uh, memorandums and agreements to teachers union. I mean, those are on hold. Um, obviously, we're in a challenging uh, situation uh, being impacted by our COVID-19, but, but that's uh, on hold pending bargaining. Um, update early contract strategy that's been happening with human resources operations. Uh, we've uh, built time engagement proposal and approval has, has occurred. Uh, we will uh, also second part of tonight. Uh, we've been uh, reviewing our, our revenue forecast. Thank you, uh, finance, enrollment projections, uh, the levy submission deadlines, these items have been completed. And the point of tonight is just to uh, show you that work is happening. We don't want to get to the point regarding the conference of district design um, where, um, you know, we, we get to the outcome stage of our work. And if something isn't working or isn't progressing, we don't want that to be a surprise. And in fact, um, we, we're going to com uh, commit, to continue to commit to making sure that we're giving you an update on process. Process matters and ensures that we're successful. So uh, that's just a quick update um, of the CDD. Um, and then at this point, I can either uh, take questions or go directly to the second part um, uh, for the enrollment. Perhaps I'll just go to the enrollment update, if that's okay, uh, uh, Chair Ellison and Superintendent. Um, so the second part of the CDD, and this is um, really what we've been spending a lot of time in, in February, January, February, is uh, really looking at, at enrollment and the rest of the enrollment and placement. I just wanted to quickly talk about how enrollment projections are calculated. I know there was some major concern as we engaged in the conference and district design process about loss of students as a loss, uh, result of the conference of district design. Um, to layer on to that, uh, we have had a loss of students regarding uh, uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic that we're in. Uh, so if you could go back to the previous slide. Uh, we'll talk about uh, factors impact enrollment, enrollment trends. Uh, there's been a nice uh, recent report from uh, uh, AMSD that talks about uh, just how other districts have struggled with declines in enrollment regarding the pandemic. So I wanna put some our, our enrollment loss in context. Um, enrollment process timeline, and I'll show you some early enrollment data that, that shows some promising uh, signs of the, the conference of district design. So there's four areas really we want to look at is birth rates. Um, birth rates are declining um, in our city and actually nationally. Kindergarten enrollment, uh, that's our first real data point um, in which we then typically project outward in a co uh, co cohort transition process. Uh, looking at uh, the number of students we have and then applying a, a tr a attrition trend uh, based upon at least three years of data. Uh, what makes it challenging during the conference of district design is that we have a number of students moving from school. So um, we have uh, pulled together a team across finance and transportation, research and evaluation, of course, student placement uh, to really take a look at, at having accurate projections. But here are the factors that, that uh, impact enrollment. Um, you know, first of all, enrollment projections. Uh, we are, you know, as I mentioned before, boundaries and transition students. So currently we both changed our boundaries and then we've also allowed, if you recall, schools that are changing uh, to magnets, those families have the options to stay. Um, if a magnet has, has shifted to another school, but the theme has remained, those families are allowed to transition to those new locations. So we're currently in the process of verifying, we'll be uh, in the process of verifying if the transition students uh, that have been trans uh, transitioned, for example, a Falwell Arts Program uh, student has the option to transition in either to Marcy or Bethune, those are new arts programs. Uh, so we're currently in the process of verifying if that is indeed the case, we project those families to attend uh, our COVID-19 impact, you'll see some numbers there that impact the pandemic, uh, but roughly um, it's going to impact uh, about 400 students uh, net, about 450 net um, that we've lost. Primarily 90% of those uh, losses in the enrollment we anticipate will be at the K-2 level. Um, you know, we do know that opening up will make a difference. Uh, a student placement has already seen families enroll previously that have not enrolled in Minneapolis, so they're enrolling their students back uh, to Minneapolis public schools. Uh, but we're keeping our eye on uh, the pandemic and those lower grade levels in particular. 
Uh, we know obviously that our competitors impact our market share. And so part of the comprehensive district design as we looked at enrollment um, is we're really asking our uh, schools to really own their communities, to take pride in increasing the number of families in a school attendance zone that want to make Minneapolis public schools their first choice. So we anticipate with our programming that we have the uh, ability to pull students back uh, uh, to our public schools and, and with some of the exciting things I think I mentioned previously um, as in terms of the benefits of the comprehensive district design. Uh, in particular, we're, you know, when we look at the additional investments, the additional investments focus on climate, climate safety and academics. So the exact reasons that our families are identifying, they, they um, no longer have Minneapolis public schools as their first choice, uh, the, the CDD allocations, the benefits that we've identified are directly addressing issues of climate, uh, safety, and, and, and academic rigor. So, so we're confident that our investments will make a difference in increasing our market share. Uh, we also pay attention to out-of-area attendance. Um, and then the, the other is um, housing availability. Um, you know, that, this is going to become more critical as we move to more of a community school model. Uh, you know, it, taking a look at, at housing, stock housing availability in particular areas. Obviously, we talked about um, housing avail availability of affordable housing does impact our ability to economically integrate our schools. And so we're going to need to continue to partner with the city uh, supporting affordable housing in all areas of the city. And then the last is just our immigration policy. Um, and I, I don't think it's a stretch to say that um, you know, the Biden administration will be more supportive of having more of an open immigration policy uh, than the previous uh, Trump administration. And uh, that, that'll impact us in two ways. That'll impact our free and just lunch counts, I anticipate, and I'll show you some data there. Um, and then I also will just clearly, it'll impact uh, uh, the number of students, uh, recent immigrants, uh, uh, that would have the opportunity to attend the Elms Public Schools. So um, something to, to pay attention to, and, and there is a clear relationship between uh, national policy um, and, and immigration. Uh, not to spend a lot of time, but I do want to, this, this is a, a, a slide that, and we showed this during the conference of district design, but it shows just the relationship between um, context, local context, policy, um, and how that impacts enrollment. So, um, you know, you see a clear enrollment decline. I'll just show you as we started to uh, receive 1974 to court order to desegregate. Um, you see open enrollment, you see you know, the year 2000, the choice is yours. Um, I would argue the combination of open enrollment and charters that you start seeing the first charters um, after a period of time did lead to declining enrollment in Minneapolis public schools. Um, the next piece on the line, if we put another uh, bullet point here, uh, would be the epi epidemic, the pandemic that we're in. Um, and so uh, that does have an impact on enrollment. Uh, you know, enrollment trends by race, uh, just uh, what you see, they've actually been fairly steady. Uh, if you look at the top African-American, 36% of our enrollments uh, African-American, 3% American Indian, 6% uh, Asian, currently 17% Hispanic, 37% white. Uh, we have seen uh, increases over the years since 2009, 2010 uh, in our white population. Other uh, uh, groups have remained fairly steady, up or down one to two percent. Uh, what's interesting, that uh, there's two ways to look at this graph, and this is what we're going to investigate. One could say that that more white families are choosing Minneapolis, um, but we do know that the market share for our white families is significantly higher uh, than the market share for our families of color. Um, we also know that when we look at decline enrollment in previous years, Again, 80% of that loss of enrollment of our student our family population, student population, have been families of color. Okay, so there's a relationship when you look at the declining enrollment uh, for our groups of color, I think it's more aligned to our lack of ability to meet their needs. I um, mean, in some cases, one could argue, you know, we have been substantially in the past, uh, you know, really uh, meeting the needs well um, in many of our white families, particularly in, in certain areas of the city. Enrollment trends by student group, uh, but so uh, first take, I'd like you to take a look at uh, my left, uh, but the, the free reduced lunch eligible, I mean, this illustrates the point as mentioned, 
Um, if the yellow is non-free juice lunch uh, and the purple would be free juice lunch at, at the bottom. You do see a decline since 2015, 2000, actually 2015 uh, regarding our free juice lunch, uh, those students who qualify for educational benefits. Um, and so you see a clear relationship. I think we've declined about 8% uh, since 15, 16. Um, why does that matter? That does impact uh, allocations for both Title I um, and compensatory education. Um, we know that it's been challenging um, for our families, uh, given the climate uh, for many of our families, um, to, um, to feel comfortable filling out the, the, the form. Uh, that qualifies our, our students for free energy lunch. So um, our principals were very diligent, our schools are very diligent, our staff in getting families uh, to fill out the educational benefit form uh, this year in spite of the pandemic. Uh, but our numbers actually dropped, uh, we're anticipating that number goes from 55 to 52 uh, for 21-22. So uh, we're gonna have to do a lot of work um, uh, getting the, the families to fill out the form. It, it obviously is a lot of, um, impact on, on educational benefits. Uh, to the right, I believe this is uh, our English language learners. Uh, you also see a corresponding decline uh, in the, the, of families uh, participating in services. And then at the bottom, you see special education. I believe that's been fairly constant. So here, uh, quickly, our enrollment projections, uh, and, you, and you've seen this in the pro forma, uh, but I think that uh, I want to point out a couple of pieces here. Um, if you look at fiscal 22, um, so school year 21-22 next year, we, didn't, we anticipate a decline of about 1,329 students. Uh, now, the original, we originally we anticipated that uh, our normal decline is about 645 in enrollment. We added another 300 students because the CDD um, and then we would add another 400 or so, um, obviously because of, of COVID-19. Um, and, and so uh, the, this decline kind of mirrors, at least because, our, as I mentioned, our kindergarten enrollment, um, it, it does mirror some of the impacts of, of the pandemic. Um, but then again, what, you, what we expect to see in subsequent years, and you do see the decline, the rate of change, um, is that we start losing less students. And so by the time we get to FY, 25, school year 24-25, um, you start seeing that we've leveled out in enrollment. And then um, by school year 25-26, fiscal year 26, you start to see that we start increasing enrollment again as we fully implement uh, our conference of district design. Uh, this becomes critical because every year we will be monitoring enrollment. We'll be providing updates to you as school board. Uh, this is a, a critical data point to see the extent to which our conference of district design is indeed meeting uh, uh, you know, our claim and, and the intent that is to provide a well-rounded education and, and to create a climate in which our families are seeing Minneapolis as a first choice. Uh, so this is a comparison um, to other districts and, and this is uh, uh, from a, a recent uh, a state report. Um, but what you're seeing is just a total enrollment decline um, overall, so Minneapolis, um, about 2.8%, um, that, that, that could be attributed. And then again, we're anticipating we're gonna get about half of those students back. Um, so it ends up being, we're anticipating 3.3% decline plus, I think roughly, roughly one point, or 3% decline plus a, another 1.4. Um, but but this is uh, 2.8, and that'll be ended up in 3.7% uh, decline. Right, St. Paul 1.7, Osceola and Bloomington. So we're we're comparable. Uh, we are seeing um, uh, out of the out of the five groups. I mean, I think our kindergarten enrollment is is second to the highest compared to, to Bloomington. But um, obviously, we're all being impacted by the by the pandemic, and and so this is just proof that that is indeed the case. I wanted to show you the enrollment process and timeline. Um, and so we are in the purple area. Um, in February, we will be running our, our lottery uh, for our school requests. Uh, as mentioned, we'll send out placement letters to families, letting them know uh, if they didn't get indeed get into the school that, that they uh, desired. Um, and then um, we'll do a second lottery 
um, in April per recommendations of our Equity Diversity Impact Assessment Committee and internal conversations and board approval. Um, the second lottery will support um, uh, EDIA findings, Equity Diversity Impact Assessment findings that parents weren't proportionally participating in the lottery and that lotteries are extremely complicated. Um, I think it becomes even more critical uh, during a pandemic. We wanna make sure that our families have the opportunity to participate in the choice process. And so we'll take a look at our numbers. We're looking at our numbers now uh, for registrations. Um, and then we do active recruitment, making sure that people are aware of what their opportunities are uh, for the different uh, schools, particular magnet schools. And then uh, uh, we end up having our October one as our official enrollment count. So here's some early enrollment data. I'll certainly have more for you. Uh, what I'm looking for um, is uh, uh, look at, we'll just look at the African American population. So uh, 2018, uh, for those who did placement requests, 11% are African American, 13% uh, 2019, 12% 2020, 13% 2021. On the surface, this may appear a, a bit unremarkable. I mean, these aren't large margins, but I do think that uh, the pandemic, COVID-19, did present significant challenges in communication. We were, we're very much a relational culture. Uh, we are a culture of previous years that has events. And so um, testament to uh, folks that have been able to reach out and, and do a number of online events, uh, particularly you know, our principals have done some remarkable online events uh, to support the registration process, our communications department. Similarly, has done a great job communicating, uh, shifting our approach uh, to an online approach. Um, you do see a difference here for our Hispanic, Hispanic population. Um, I think that um, obviously uh, this is where, um, you know, there could be some communication issues. And so uh, this gives us an opportunity when you do a second lottery, again, to double down uh, and make sure that uh, when you see a gap here, we can target uh, some of our Spanish speaking families and make sure that they are aware of their options and they can participate in the lottery. Um, and so, uh, you know, for your interest lunch uh, eligible, I mean, it's not, the margins are uh, actually fairly remarkable uh, given the pandemic. And I think the critique that uh, we wouldn't have families be able to participate in the lottery. So what I expect is the second lottery, uh, these numbers are actually gonna get much better. And which is why we had a round two. Next slide. Uh, the other is we're looking at kindergarten. That's an entry point. You just saw that. Uh, this is sixth grade. And so uh, we're actually seeing, uh, this is very different. Uh, this is for sixth grade. You're actually seeing more, more families of color participate in the lottery. Uh, and so if you look at the first uh, for African-American population, um, African-American uh, population, 50% of the request representing 37% of the enrollment. Uh, so you do see, um, you know, also you see uh, there's a little underrepresentation from American Indian, uh, Asian, Pacific Islander, but our Hispanic population is actually participating at uh, the sixth grade, a greater proportion of the population. So this is just early information, but, we'll, you know, what we want to make sure is that um, our families of color in particular as identified as the equity diversity impact assessment, um, are uh, getting to participate in the choice process. And this gives us confidence that uh, they are. Uh, and so we're gonna continue to do uh, ongoing recruitment. Uh, the registration pro uh, opportunities, your families are still able to register, um, but uh, we'll do a second lottery in April. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll have a, another opportunity um, for families once letters are sent out, um, if they're still not getting their their guaranteed choice or their ideal choice, uh, they'll still have an opportunity to apply for, for another location, particularly our magnet schools. Uh, the last thing I want to point out is that, um, you know, one of the commitments with the Conference of District Design is that we did uh, want to reduce the number of schools of fewer than 250 students. Um, and so uh, early, we're seeing that we had seven schools uh, that had under 250. And so for 21, 22, we're projecting five schools. I feel like we're gonna get that even better uh, by the time we um, come back and report back. If you look at the next slide in June, we get to the second lottery. Go to the next slide. So the next steps, um, you know, there'll be a second round of data that we'll be able to present to you. 
Um, you know, letters, again, are going home confirming placements in early March. Uh, at that point, uh, families will be reminded um, of their um, community school. Uh, they'll also be provided be provide an opportunity to, to continue to apply uh, to magnets. Uh, we'll have a second round of lottery in April. Uh, and then we'll have data available to present to you, the board and the public. Uh, we'll be able to take a look at the number of racially isolated schools, identifiable schools. Um, I can tell you we will have less racially identifiable schools as a result of the conference of district design. Um, I can tell you with confidence we will have significantly less schools that are 80% or higher for induced lunch. Uh, I'll also be able to present to you our magnet school demographics. Um, with particular attention paid to, to kindergarten um, and again, sixth grade, because if you recall, we transitioned families, uh, families were allowed to stay in their magnet um, if they if they wanted to, as a community school is being converted to a magnet. Um, and then I'll provide, be able to provide you additional registration numbers and I expect to see greater participation. Uh, also uh, with our proportional participation with our families of color and our white families. Uh, so that's what I have for you tonight. I went through that fairly quickly, but I also wanna be cognizant of time. Um, we'll have much more information for you in June, uh, but happy to take any questions. Um, Superintendent, uh, uh, Chair Ellison, and then um, if I'm not able to answer a question, I'm certainly comfortable um, coming back and, and presenting that to you either in the board update or at a future presentation. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Superintendent Graff. Thank you, Senior Officer Moore, for that update. Um, I have Director Inns, you have a question? I do have a question. Thanks. I forgot my camera was on. <laughs> um, um, my question is, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Ellison. Um, but I don't know if this question is for Senior Officer Moore or someone else, but um, I, I think um, uh, I'm really grateful for all this information. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, if I were, I am a parent in the schools right now, right? But uh, what maybe other parents might be thinking and trying to envision what their school is gonna look like next year. Um, so folks making decisions about schools and they're gonna be leaving, you know, the results of their lottery uh, or whatever we call it, their school choice, whatever we, you know, call that process. Um, uh, and, how can we make sure that um, the folks in um, the individual schools, to use your term on a granular level, um, uh, senior officer Moore, um, they, they know what their school is gonna be like, you know? Yeah. Uh, how are we gonna know if we're gonna have, uh, what language offerings are gonna exist in a middle school or what that IB implementation is gonna look like or how many students are gonna be there or, you know, all those things that people want to know uh, before they decide um, what they're going to do in the fall. Um, I, I think a lot of people still have a lot of questions. We made a lot of promises about capital investment, for instance. Um, are those things going forward? And how are we making sure that that information is being communicated to families? Is it through their individual schools, do the schools, do the principals know the answers to those questions? Do the site councils know the answers to those questions? I know a lot of this stuff is tied up in the budget process as well, but you know, the sooner and the more detailed we are in getting information out to people about what their schools are gonna look like in the fall, the happier they're gonna be. So, um, I, you know, if the Superintendent Graff or Senior Officer Moore or someone else could comment on that, I'd appreciate it, thank you. Chair, Chair Ellison, um, Director Enns, I, I hear your urgency around that and I, I do wanna acknowledge, um, as you already alluded to, so much of this is part of the budget process and identifying um, through the budget process what those enrollment numbers look like and then what the staffing will be available um, for, for considerations for next year. But we have made those commitments around <laughs> program offerings um, and as well as capital improvements and those are adopted by the board. And so it's our intent to implement those, um, you know, with that integrity that we've, we've committed to. Any changes to that or any updates we have around capital improvements um, will obviously come before the board. Um, and we should see some of those discussions happening at the, I think our, our finance committee meeting in the near future. But as far as the programming specifically, um, Senior Officer Moore, I don't know if you have any uh, 
new information about what we've what we've discussed with uh, um, implementation for next year. I know that Dr. Fearing has put a lot in place already. Um, so maybe we can share a little bit of that programming information for next year. Dr. Fearing, I mean, I can certainly, so I'll, I'll start. I mean, I can certainly share that. Um, you know, there has been a commitment um, as we've gone through this process to, to increase our communication with our principals. Uh, you know, as this process is an organic process, as we're developing the budget, schools are now uh, this week going over their budgets and they're engaging in conversations with their site council. So conversations with their site council are occurring now about uh, resources and programming. And so, um, and then in the spring, right, we're having additional conversations regarding uh, the climate framework. There'll be a lot of transitioning conversations in various communities. Um, I did want to mention that in March, again, uh, communication will go out to families, reminding them of their choice. So, so I and their new location. I want to be very clear that we're we're very aware that we're doing this work in the pandemic, and that some families may be distracted um, or may have missed the communication. So, we're going to communicate again um, in, in March uh, to families, letting them know what their placement is. Um, A for those students who or those families that applied. Uh, for another choice, but also we'll send out reminders to families, just letting them know um, that, um, again, this is your uh, community school. Uh, we'll also be, um, we're having conversations about parent or, or principals reaching out to their new uh, populations with welcoming those new families to the school and engaging those conversations. Uh, just had a presentation about the CDD and actually enrollment. Uh, to our family uh, liaisons, uh, so not every school has one, but for many of them do. Um, so we've reached out to our family liaisons. So um, we're just we're just committed to continuing to make sure that both internally, people are informed about the comprehensive district design. Um, we're going to leverage our school communities. Um, we expect a lot of, of, of community conversations that to occur. We've been meeting monthly with our principals about different elements of the comprehensive district design. Uh, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Amy, but, you know, to talk about additional programming, uh, but, but very committed to communicating, making sure our principals are in the loop to what they can expect uh, with the additional resources. Um, we've had many conversations even recently with regarding the budget. And so um, that is occurring now. Hi, thanks for the question. Um, I think there was a slide in your presentation that kind of listed all the different academic pieces that are going on along with distance learning, the pandemic. Um, but I can say that, you know, one of the things that we really highlighted was the ability for <clears throat> all of our schools, K through 12, to be able to offer a well-rounded um, education. I know that can sound cliche, but it was very evident that we had schools um, for various reasons that had um, a lot of elective offerings um, and some that had very few. And so we wanted to be able to level kind of that, that playing field. So regardless of where a student went to school, there was some basic, you know, academic programming that we think all schools should have it in, in this day and age. And so one of those things was the instrumental music for fifth grade. So we've um, gone through and we've taken inventory, taken stock, the schools that have um, currently offering instrumental music for fourth and fifth, they'll be able to obviously continue to offer that. But we did purchase instruments so that all of our uh, K-5 schools, um, including our magnet schools, would have um, instrumental music. We also, on top of that, uh, purchased um, strings, so like ukuleles, um, you know, there's one other kind of instrument, and I'll probably say it wrong, so I'm not going to say it. But um, so that students can also um, have that opportunity as well. So because sometimes we say musical instrument, someone thinks a tuba, right? But we also will have other kinds of musical instruments um, for students at that level. So we're in the process of working with human resources to get a head start in recruiting because we will have now um, with the savings from transportation, um, the ability to hire 15 uh, FTE uh, instrumental music teachers, which is a lot because it is kind of a hard to fill area. So. Um, but we're getting a head start on that. Um, I would also say another um, really great opportunity that we have is our world language. We've really increased our world language um, staffing and opportunity for all of our students. Um, one of the things that, you know, as you kind of take stock across the district, for schools that offered ID, they already had world language because that's part of the instructional model. But for our schools that didn't, um, it wasn't necessary, necessarily an option uh, 612 for all of our students. 
And we know in this day and age, world language, not just the language, but the culture that goes along with it um, is really important for our students. So we were able to um, um, allocate a full-time world language teacher. So every 6 eight school has at least one world language. We also went and targeted our smaller high schools because often in, in budget constraints, that's one of the areas that they're unable to fill. So uh, looking at schools like Harrison, uh, Longfellow, Stadyview, um, uh, having those uh, schools also have the ability to offer a world language. Um, I would also say that we um, upped our allocation in Indian Ed. So now we'll be able to offer a Dakota language um, and then hire a teacher for that. And then considering also to put Ojibwe online so that students across the district can take that. And so it's not just limited to the best practice site. So um, looking at expanding those options as well. Um, and then just really quickly, because I know we're running late here. Um, so we, as you know, we expanded MYP or part of International Baccalaureate for all of our middle schools. We have two schools that will start the work on becoming authorized. That's Anderson and Page. But we're also taking a really close look at all of our 6-8 schools and making sure that our AVID programming and our IB programming really are integrated in a culturally sustaining way mm -hmm. so that our students are getting a much more rigorous and aligned support system so that they're better prepared to um, access the advanced academic courses when they get to high school. So the, all the middle school principals have been meeting about that and are committed to that work to having a much more aligned um, instructional framework between AVID and um, MYP. And then going down to our um, elementary schools, we're really looking at putting a lot of resources and support for K-2 literacy um, math um, teachers. So um, as you know, this year we started out with our title sites that were 70% or higher uh, benefit eligible. So they all received a 0.5 a coach for the, specifically for kindergarten through second grade um, teams. So next year we're expanding to all of our schools. And I think one thing that's mm -hmm. really important to me is that we've had students who were struggling in literacy and math in all of our schools, even if the school might have posted at 90% proficiency, right? And so we need to be able to support all of our schools because every school has learners that need that support in literacy and math, um, not just the schools that have a high concentration. And so we have allocated uh, title funding um, to be able to support our title schools and then other funding to support a non-title school. So um, those coaches will then have um, training and PD really working on the elements um, of literacy, foundational and um, early literacy and math. We are also pairing with early childhood education and um, firming up that pathway from um, high five to kindergarten because we don't want there to be a gap in between literacy and math as they move from high five programming. So um, we're working on that as well. So that's um, actually pretty exciting work to see kind of how that alignment and trajectory is working. And the last thing I'd highlight is just really our STEM for all. Um, so we've met with our building administrators and we've kind of laid out the foundations of the um, approach to STEM for all for K-8. And again, STEM for all isn't like something separate. It's more of an integrated approach of making sure science, technology, engineering, math is brought into what is being taught or what is being um, instructed in the K-8 setting. And so just for an example, working with our 6-8 um, schools again, really building up that 6-8 piece, um, we're looking at how to use the design class that's part of the MYP framework but also having that satisfy that STEM for all uh, through Project Lead the Way and some other opportunities. So you can see that we're trying to weave in these things so it's not extra, not you know putting things on top of each other, but actually weaving in the way the instructional frameworks are meant to be. Um, and so then putting all of that together, um, really supporting our principals and having an understanding of what all that means, making sure staff have the opportunity to be trained, um, and then making sure that we have a plan for implementation like look for is what does that look like and then how can we message to our communities what the experience should be like for all of our students and again all of these things that i've talked about have been inclusionary of our english learners or students with special needs to make sure all those different perspectives are added in so we're supporting all of our students as um, general ed students first and then how the other services then uh, support that uh, Thank you, uh, uh, Senior Officer Fearing. Um, I appreciate that detail. 
Um, I, I just want to reiterate again, I think it's very, very important that we communicate to our families as quickly as possible what these changes are going to look like at their schools and what they can expect. For example, if you're talking about the mid-years IB program uh, mm -hmm. at PAGE, right? Um, the, the families that are at PAGE need to know what changes are going to take place at their school um, by virtue of that middle years program. So the language offerings, for example, the uh, arts, um, uh, the, all those things that go with uh, the mid-years program. So um, I think Superintendent Graff, uh, Senior Officer Moore, I, it's just super important that um, people know that things are going forward as we're pointing out here today, and this is what that's going to mean at your school. Certainly, a lot of these things are budget dependent, but some of these things aren't budget dependent, and we know that we're going to be able to implement them. And so that needs to get out to people in the schools as quickly as possible and as clearly as possible. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Chair, uh, Chair Ellison, if I may just uh, support uh, Director End's comments. I know that we did put out information from our Office of Communications and Marketing to our um, school principals last week around just this very topic. So. Um, we'll certainly follow up and make sure, you know, they had a window of February um, 18th through March 5th to put some of this communication out around uh, the different marketing and offerings that they're going to be having in their in their schools. So we'll make sure we support that and appreciate you bringing that uh, to our attention and awareness to the public as well. Yeah, and then, you know, it's one thing to put it out there. It's another thing for it to be received, right? So we have to make sure that it's being received as well. It's not enough maybe to just send an email for a principal, right? There's a collaborative budgeting process at these schools through the, um, the site councils. And in, in some cases it's effective through the site councils. In some cases it's not, there's not a lot of clarity. So, um, you know, it's, it's really crucial when we're making these big changes that we uh, communicate them as effectively and clearly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, um, Director Inns. Uh, Director Arneson? Uh, thank you. I know that we're that uh, that first question. I think exhausted all of our time. So I don't. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to ask any more questions here tonight, which is okay. I understand that. I do just want to. Um, I will follow up in writing, and we can either um, you know have a written update, or maybe we can answer these questions at our next business meeting. But really, my questions. I just want to let people know that my questions are along the lines of interpreting in this data and kind of uh, follow, getting some impressions on that. So kind of, for example, are we expecting, based on the enrollment thus far, are we thinking maybe an extra large kindergarten class next year, right? Some might say that that maybe is gonna be an extra large. Do we have some impressions for our, from our ninth grade enrollment? Um, do we think that, you know, are we hoping that, are we seeing that maybe some trends that that will be more balanced among our high schools? Um, are we seeing how is enrollment compared to this time previous year for our magnets? Those sorts of questions. Uh, it, it's tempting, but we should not try to even answer any of these questions tonight because we are at 845, 847, which is two minutes past uh, Director Ellison's hard stop time, I noticed when she commented. So our follow up in writing and we can follow up from my colleagues as well. Thank you, Director Arneson. We will be coming, we will be getting, you know, regular comprehensive district design updates. Um, but directors, if you have any specific questions from tonight, if you could also put that in writing um, in an email to staff, um, that would be great. Superintendent Graff, any final remarks? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Ellison. And in the interest of time, I, I did wanna say we started this evening with a celebration and I wanna conclude our meeting this evening with celebrating uh, School Board Recognition Week. Uh, the Minnesota School Boards Association has set February 22nd through the 26th as the Minnesota School Board Recognition Week. And I think uh, as an educator, I know we all know the importance and significance of public education in our society um, when we're not operating in a pandemic. Um, but you know, it cannot be overstated how significant the, the work of the Minneapolis Public Schools Board is to our society and our community, and especially now more than ever, uh, the contributions you're all making are um, to public service are you know, um, essential and are providing uh, the district and Minneapolis community uh, the much needed uh, assistance during this time. So as a superintendent, I just wanna say thank you to all of the directors um, and honor you for your commitment to Minneapolis public schools and to our students and staff.
So thank you again. I uh, appreciate all of you. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Graff. Uh, that concludes our agenda for this evening. Our next scheduled meeting is on March 9th. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Good night.